One, two, three, boom, it's Mind Pump time. Welcome back to the best fitness podcast in the universes. There's multiple universes. I learned this the other day. Apparently, there's a multiverse. And uh, we were recently ranked number one in all of them. We actually did a scientific survey here in the studio with Adam and Justin, and we all voted. And guess who won? We did. We got first place. Anyway, here's the giveaway today. Maps Aesthetic. You can get free access to Maps Aesthetic. All you got to do is the following. Leave a comment below in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. Do that and subscribe to this channel and turn on your notifications. If you do all those things and if we like your comment, we'll notify you and you get free access to the bodybuilder-inspired MAPS program called MAPS Aesthetic. Also, we got a sale going on right now. 50% off MAPS anywhere. This is a workout you can do literally anywhere. It requires no equipment. Still phenomenal for muscle building and metabolism boosting. And our Fit Mom Bundle is 50% off, which includes MAPS Anywhere, MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Hit, and the new and the Intuitive Nutrition Guide, okay? So it's already discounted because it's a bundle, but you can take an additional 50% off. If you're interested, head over to mapsfitnessproducts.com, click on one of those, check it out, and then when you sign up, make sure you use the code NOVEMBER50 for that discount. All right, here comes the show. I know I said this on the like last episode about the sled, but I am such a, con I'm so converted now, Justin. Yeah, now you're an evangelist, sled. bro. It's, you know what? It's, I tell you what, you, starting your leg workouts with the sled is so, it's a great way to start your workout because oh, it's so easy pump, on the joints. Right? Yeah. So easy on the joints. And then I get into my squat. I did it today. I did the, I only had 40 minutes to do my workout. Started with the sled right, right into squats and yeah. I felt phenomenal. And it gets I, everything moving. It does. And I'm building muscle as a result. And I, I'm, convinced it has to do with the lack of the negative portion of the rep mm -hmm. allows you just to focus on the positive which i think requires less um i don't know less mobility well and the pressure in the joints is uh you know substantially lower so it it really does help to kind of just get the muscle activation portion uh, really fired off yeah now i want to ask you this because we have a sled here in the studio and there's two sides to it one mm -hmm. you're more upright when you're driving it that's yeah. easier uh-huh the other one, you're down lower when you're driving it. Uh, tell me the difference between the two, because I noticed obviously the it's harder. Well, <laughs> well you're gonna get more. Thanks, you're gonna get more yeah. glute engagement on the lower one than you are on the upper one. It's just a greater the range upper, of motion, the upper, right? The right. upper, if you think about the angle that you're hitting uh, when your arms are up on the top, you're gonna get more hamstring and quad drive off mm -hmm. of that. If you get all the way down like this, you're almost like you're doing like a, a stepper. So you're getting this. A you're basically in a bear crawl, yeah. you know, at that point too. Right. And that's why it's it's such a different feel too. That's where I, like I take somebody through just like crawling patterns and it's it's interesting to watch, you know, certain people like, like for myself, like it's not really that hard, but you'll take somebody that doesn't ever do any kind of crawling pattern. And it's like the most difficult thing you ever made them yeah, do. Yeah, I'm so mad that I didn't know that I really didn't discover this um, during my trainer years because it's an appropriate, it's very rare to find an appropriate exercise that is effective for beginners yeah. and for advanced because I can put yeah. almost anybody on a sled, not mm -hmm. everybody, but almost anybody with no weight, for example, and have them do that. And they might not be able to squat. They might not be able to, to, to do a lunge. They might not be able to do anything else, but they can push a sled. Yeah. And then when you're advanced, obviously you just load it. And you push heavy load and you get great benefit. Also. It was my favorite tool for uh, when I had, um, you know, advanced stage clients too. Like I would, I would just have them Easy. driving the sled. Yeah. Because they could go at their own pace. And the thing is they can stop and kind of back off. Like when the pressure gets too hard and it's not like, you know, you're in this awkward position now where you're compromised or something with the barbell. Um, so that was a great thing, but you could also pull it too, which That's, is, you know, another amazing, um, uh, way to use the sled and, and activate, you know, your posterior chain. That's one of my favorite ways to use it that I never see anybody doing like, so, and Where not, you're facing the sled and you're walking. Yeah. Backwards. You're and I actually do it. I, I do it different. Than I see a lot, a lot of people I see pull it that way and they, they use it for a lot of more back, like back. I know I've done that with Justin before where we're, we're, we're like, we're yanking yeah, it, we're rowing it, sled but I rest. actually like to slow drag it and sit my ass down at 90 degrees. Yep. So I sit in the squatted position. It's just, it's a pure leg extension. Mm -hmm. And I walk backwards, slow and controlled. Oh, You're pushing oh, your heels a you lot You get more. the, yeah. yes, you get the most nasty leg pump from doing that. doesn't take a lot of weight to do it. Um, love that super functional and if and you're literally doing a leg extension i mean when you're, you're you're squatting your butt down at 90 degrees and then you are just walking backwards 
and it just mm. pumps the shit out of the well all, along the lines of of health um i read did you guys read that article that we got in our group thread the Who? one about what age is is appropriate oh yeah digital health. oh we've had this discussion multiple times on the show well they're I, they're saying they're getting closer to the like obviously all the research and, and the, there's not a lot of research unfortunately because no. it's a really I mean, new thing yeah it's right. only, i mean the last what 15 20 years it's been that the, it's really this generation right now that are coming into mm -hmm. you know early teens or preteen years are the first generation that was born with the iPhone, yes. right? So everybody else, it, it was introduced later. So we're, we're starting to gather more data around, okay, what are the positive and negative things around uh, allowing kids to use these tools uh, at a really early age? And according to that article, they're saying 11 is where they start to see a... Well, I'll disagree because they mm -hmm. said there's positives and negatives to starting at a young who age. Who conducted this study? Was it part of Facebook? I don't know. Behavior. Well, I don't know who actually funded or what, but these behavioral scientists yeah. are the ones that are doing the research. It was not a social media company. Okay. But they showed, they said the negatives were. They're Good more, question though, by the they're, way. They're less, they become <laughs> yeah. less empathetic First online. So of. if you start at an early age, you're less empathetic online. You're more likely to be around online bullying and to contribute to bullying. Obviously, Searching. Because you're on there. Inappropriate oh, yeah. content. Yeah. And then the positives, and here's where I disagree. The positives say that they're at younger ages more likely to engage in civic and societal like kind of problems and <laughs> problem solving and duties. Oh, God. Just what I want, my fucking ten year old. <laughs> yeah, they need to be concerned like with the problems of the world. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's not, not immediately that. Okay, people need to understand how stressful that is to a ten year old. It's stupid. You, you, you. When you're ten, oh, shit. When you're fifteen or sixteen or eighteen. And you're seeing this global issue or this complex problem that you literally can do nothing about. Like there's yeah. nothing you could do about it. Not only it. that, you're not seeing anything. You're being fed a narrative mm -hmm. at 10 years old, 11 years old. Then all of a sudden you become 16 and you become this huge activist about something you really don't know shit about. But because you've been reading it on social media, right. you think you're an expert. It sounds good to say. That is what, and then, and yeah. shit, I think that's a lot of our damn problem right now is yeah. that you have these, these kids that were 11, 12, 13 years old, just five to seven years ago mm -hmm. and they have been fed with this this bullshit narrative that they just read on yeah. facebook or instagram and they're not told what they can do like because if you're 11 and you're reading about climate change you're what you what you can do what's within your power is to consume less mm -hmm. uh, you know recycle that kind of stuff but that's not what's happening an 11 year old seeing this and going we, I need to like protest. I need to write all these things. I need to get angry. I need to be stressed out because there's nothing I can do about it. Yeah. I, okay. We grew up towards the end of the Cold War. Okay. Could you imagine if we were inundated with the challenges of the Cold War at 11 years old? I couldn't imagine how stressed out I'd yeah, be. Thank God they kept uh, that stuff from me. They, and they kept it from you mainly because we didn't. We weren't. We didn't have media in our yeah, faces. Yeah, they couldn't all reach the time. you. They would yeah. if they could have. Yeah, you didn't watch the news at six o'clock. Your dad did. Like I was out. I was playing with my friends. I don't give a shit about the news. But if I'm on Instagram and social media all the time, I'm constantly seeing it. So I don't think that's a positive at all. I don't think your kid uh -uh. should be hit and hammered with global, big, complex issues. I think they should be taught the stuff that they can do now, which is like, hey. Uh, do, did you clean and organize your room? Hey, mm -hmm. are you working hard? Are you doing your homework? Are you nice to your friends? Are you dealing with, you know, the people around you? Like that's the stuff yeah. that they should. Okay, isn't on. the problem always like they're not focusing enough on school? Right. Right. Like it, it, this is always the challenge when you get the report card, you get to talk to the teachers you, and, and yet we want to inundate them with like all these other problems. Like oh. it, the whole game for me as a parent is like, how much do I really want to, uh, expose my my child to uh all these these bigger things like that are out there and like at what point in their development do i think it's appropriate and so this is like one of those yes. things like I, i'm not too sure that uh, the experts here are, are hitting the mark at all no. well this is uh, i mean i'll play the other side then so uh, it's inevitable they're going to get on social media eventually right so what age do you guys think for your family, your household right. is appropriate for things like, and we're not talking about, well, let's talk about the, each platform. Right. Different. Okay. So take that's what we're going to go. TikTok, Instagram, Facebook. Let's talk about Snapchat. Those yeah. four, four big ones for probably kids. I would think is that right. Unless there's something that's out that I don't know about. Now. I think, uh, honestly, I think Facebook is better than Instagram. Definitely than Instagram. Definitely better than TikTok. Mm -hmm. Although kids like the tick, they like TikTok more than anything. Yep. I think because Facebook's got a little bit more content 
more family is going to be on there. More of your adult family is going to be on there. Instagram is narcissism hell. That's what I've always called it. It's just pictures, right? Uh, TikTok is very similar uh, in that sense. So you're not getting lots of information or able to engage. It's mostly just look at me. Here's how things should look. Age-wise, I don't know, man. I feel like it's different from person to person. I know my daughter is tw turning 12 and she's telling me about, my friend just got the iPhone 12 and I'd like to get, and I'm like, you're in sixth grade. No. I think mm -hmm. seventh or eighth grade is probably when you know, I'll allow, you know, I'll, that'll be something. And what is that for you? I mean, why seventh or eighth? Why not a junior in high school? Why not, you know, sixth grade? Like what, why seventh or eighth grade? What happens development wise that you think that that's more appropriate than right now? I just think it's because at some point they're the last kid not involved with uh, social interactions online. And that becomes a bit of a pressure. You, you know, what sucks with that though. And that, that as a strategy, cause I, I get where you're coming from, but that is going to that marker is going to continue to move Maybe. as it becomes oh it's already yeah. has mm. i mean when we grew up to having a phone or anything like that in high school was a big deal you know it mm -hmm. was like no nobody had a phone when i was in high school we right. had beepers that's what i'm saying <laughs> that's what i'm saying yeah. so like that became soon it became a thing where oh everybody in high school has one so mm -hmm. for sure by the time you get to high school then it became like well, you know, I, my kid does go to friends and it'd be nice to get to, so, oh, okay, they can have a phone now at this age. So they just keep moving that marker. The yeah. more that it becomes socially acceptable to do that, we're moving in that direction that these platforms are more socially accepted than they were just a decade ago. So by using that metric or formula for figuring out when to let your kid do it, that's dangerous, don't you think? Yeah, because I, I, I think- By the time my son is coming of age, maybe every sixth grader or fifth grader has- that by maybe then. or maybe it'll reverse i'm hoping because it seems like people are more aware and a little bit it, it seems like they're more aware now than they were a few years ago but maybe yeah. i'm just maybe i'm just tripping i don't know yeah i don't know i think i mean i've had multiple conversations with this based off even like video games are in a sense a social media outlet you know because they can talk to each other and they can interact and like sort of gang up on other kids uh and do things like that and so uh having more conversations within that platform specifically i want to limit a platform by platform this yeah. is not a multiple platform thing and that, i think that was like sort of a rule i've established with you know my older kid for now because he's the one that's like more inclined to all these things and i'm like okay so how do you interact with your friends on here how do um you know kids randomly come in here and how do you know and discern whether or not they're a kid or an adult? Like, yeah. can you make all those decisions? Like, are you actually having that conversation yeah. with Ethan constantly? Oh, oh, you are. Yeah, because he wants to go to TikTok next because that's where like a lot of his friends. I'm like, okay, which friends though are on TikTok? Because that also matters. Like, so for me, like, there's yeah, your dumb friend. It <laughs> is. It's like some <laughs> shitty friends. Like, I'm like, I'm like, I don't, you don't need to go hang you, out with them. You don't say that to him, do you? No, do I you? don't say that. But <laughs> I say it in a nicer way. Yeah. Uh, I'm like, but I'm like, okay. So what about this friend? What about this friend? This. I was like, oh yeah, we we hang out here. I'm like, okay. So I mean, it, so you're saying you really want to go there? Why? You know, it, it, and it's a peer pressure thing. Yeah. It, and so like to, for me. I know growing up, like I wasn't able to go to parties and all that. And I resented my parents for that. But at the same time, like that was an excuse for me not to get sucked into the peer pressure. Of right, yeah. right. Right. And so that's, to me, that's a responsibility of parents as well. You're taking the pressure off the kid to succumb to all the peer pressures. Right. Right. Because that's a lot of weight. Because now they can just say my parents. Won't yeah. They can me. just say, oh, my parents won't let me do it. Yeah, yeah that's true. And that, then that's a big relief. And, yeah. then, and people don't realize how freeing that is. Yeah. And also like where you pick your, like where your kids go to school, uh, if you have the luxury of, of really choosing, I think that's really important too. Cause we, you know, I picked schools where I could see that the parents were involved, where they had similar values it makes a big difference. Well, I wonder how many, I wonder how many could be neat to, I'm sure we'll have somebody message after I say this, but I wonder how many communities have, uh, groups, of parents that actually get together and like, let's say like in your guys' case, or let's use- Where Everett, they all agree together. Yeah, where Everett's younger. So maybe you know the moms and dads of like three or four of his best friends and you guys decide to have a beer one night and go like, hey, let's talk about the next couple of years as our kids are probably going to want That'd to be do a these great things. strategy. No, think about yeah, that, that right? And uh, I'm just curious what your guys' thoughts are on that. Are you- pro this or you have a certain age that you think it's best and have dialogue as adults first and then come to an agreement that oh, why don't it sounds like we're all leaning around this time era let's all can we all try and stay together on that that way our kids don't feel like they're other the other well, friends i'll tell you i'll tell you yeah. i know the south sounds negative with the tech stuff but watching my kids um and seeing what they do i will say this man they're better off and they they're better off in so many different ways than i was like 
My son's 16. He's a junior in high school. He's never seen a real fight at school. Never. There's been never any real violence at a school. Yeah. By the time I was 16, I had been jumped twice. I, some kid pulled a knife on me once. There were fights. I, I had gotten numerous fights. I mean, all the time. Mm -hmm. Fights all the time at school. He's never seen a single one. It they also are much more likely to engage adults. Like my son was telling me a story about this kid that's within the group of kids that they hang out. And he's not like in their group, but kind of loosely. And I guess another kid saw on, I forgot what platform, it might've been Reddit or something, where this kid said something that sounded like he was going to hurt himself. Like, oh man, I'm so depressed. I mean, I don't remember exactly what it was, but it was along the lines of, mm -hmm. man, I'm so depressed. I don't know if I can continue, you know, going on. These kids got together and contacted the school counselor and the school counselor contacted the kid's parents and got involved. Now, when I was a kid, you never said anything about stuff like that because mm -hmm. you would be a tattletale mm -hmm. or do you never tell the parents? You know, Like all the stuff that happened when I was a kid, right. my yeah, parents- are, no, that's, that's, It's very true. Does yeah. that necessarily mean they're better off though? You know, like you-, you I, With that, yeah. Well, okay, so that, that scenario, but l l play the other side of that, right? So take it back. You always love to go back to evolutionary theories, right? Okay. If you grew up in the era where you, by the age of seven, saw a bear attack and saw, you know, your dad have to wrestle a lion down or some bullshit because that's just how things were. But then as, as society evolved, we protected our children and we kept them in these areas where they wouldn't have to worry about danger like that. So now the next generation coming up, they never even saw a lion attack until they were 12 or 13 years old. Is that kid better off or is that kid actually because they were exposed well, later not know. better off? So I don't know. Would you are, rather live now or 10,000 Well, years no, ago? of course. But yeah. my point is you love to go and use that stuff I all do. the time. And, and, and there's, I think there's, there's other, a plus and a minus. I think there may be some other consequences for sure. Like, will he be, will my son be aware enough in a public situation to sense the tension in the air and know that shit's about to go down. Right. Mm -hmm. He might not be able to. Like right. I can I can smell or know, it or know the boundaries of what, right. what might get you punched in the face. Right. I knew really quick growing up because I like you had seen a lot of fights, been in fights and and so you learn certain boundaries of like what you how you can say something. The way these kids talk to each other online is not you couldn't talk to me like that as a kid when yeah. we were growing up. You get punched in the face for sure, if not by me by somebody else. So you know, there's there's right. the pros and cons to that. But weren't right? they weren't they uh, highlighting that in the article? Is like the the younger they were exposed to it, the more likely they had that sort of behavioral problem, like interacting with other people. Like they would say things without any kind of like Less empathy. Yes. empathy, right? Yes. And, and so they hadn't really developed that skill yet of like interpersonal connection with somebody else. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. It's it is interesting. There's definitely pluses and minuses, but if you look at the numbers. This is true, and it's kind of interesting. Kids are less likely to do drugs. They're less likely to die in car accidents, less likely to drink and drive, less likely to have sex at younger ages. Um, now, what's the, what are the other sides of that, right? They socialize less. Depression, anxiety is a little higher. Mm -hmm. Fear is higher. I don't know if those are all necessarily connected, but there's kind of pluses and minuses. I think we've done a good job in some ways and maybe some bad jobs in other ways? Well, I definitely like what Justin's strategy is. And I think maybe that, I mean, that's maybe the approach I think I would try and take, right? Versus saying like, oh, this is my hard age that they can or can't do something. And that's more tackling each platform individually. And then also the, the probably the main thing is the communication with your kid. I think that's where the real danger lies. That's the big is, one, dude. Is yeah. parents just saying, okay, this is the age. And then there you go. You're off and doing it versus I would rather let my kid do it earlier, but be involved in it right. and be a part of it. Like, oh, you want to well, get on YouTube or hey, you want to get on Instagram? Let's do it together. <laughs> and I get to kind of see his behaviors and the things that he chooses to watch or look at together. So I have an idea what's going on versus Oh no, you can't do that this year. But next year, when you turn thirteen, you can do that now. And then I okay, I re, I let let go. I open up the gates, mm -hmm. but then I'm not involved. Mm -hmm. right. And so who knows? Because yeah, we've does. seen that, and I think that's why you know we've kind of adjusted our strategy with that because we've seen um, some friends and kids that were just kind of okay. Here it is. Now you have access, and then they'll just get on there and they'll just post. And, and Courtney and myself will watch these like interactions every now and then in the conversations. And you're like, Oh my God. And, and then we, we talk to the parents, like, do you know they're posting this kind of, and they have no idea. Yeah. yeah. They've just haven't been paying attention. And it's it you, like, you really have to, unfortunately you have to stay on top of those yeah, things. This is where I have to give my wife a tremendous amount of credit. Same. Because same. She is so good at this. I grew up yeah. very differently than she did. Now my, my wife has had a relationship with her mom where she could tell her mom anything. 
I did not. I didn't bring up things to my parents, never talked about sex, never talked about drugs, whatever. And Jessica said one of the keys is you don't react when your kids say some crazy shit to you. And she's really good at this. It's hard for me to not react. She's really good at her poker face. Like, oh, really? Oh, what else happened? Oh, and then she'll also be very ans uh, honest with answering questions. So my daughter will go up to her and be like, oh man, my friend, my friend's older sister is vaping. And so my friend wanted to try it. And, and my internal reaction is to be like, what friend? Who's doing, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and Jessica's That's like- That's the last time you ever go over there. <laughs> yeah, and Jessica's like, wow, what happened? Wait, you, you were know? there last weekend. And, but now because- Jessica's we, like, what flavor was it? Was yeah. it watermelon or peach <laughs> flavor? <What were> they? <laughs> it, did it look like this way? No, and, and it, it's really effective. Like my kids will come to me, like my son will come to me and tell me like, oh, one of my friend's brothers, you know, tried smoking weed the other day. And I'm like remembering not to react. So I'm like, well, what happened? What was his reaction? You know, rather than being like, what? Who He did what? He shouldn't be doing that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, you know, just having that open dialogue so your kids feel like they can tell you Well, anything. yeah, if you don't, you put them on defense mode. I mean, we've all been- Or they'll this hide is, it. Or they'll I mean, hide it. Yeah, this is just relationship stuff. Every, this, is, yeah. this isn't just kids. This is husband and wife stuff. If you, every time uh, as a, a partner, you, you, you tell your partner these feelings you're having or the struggle you're doing with, and they react in a negative way or shame you or yell at you, sure. or get, what does that train you to do as a human? Forget right. being a child, just as a human. If, yeah. you, if you react in a negative way to something that someone is opening up and sharing to you, that's going to uh, that's going to make that person close down or not tell you uh, or lie to you the next time they're in that same situation. Totally. So it totally. makes a lot of Real, sense. Speaking sure. of kids, I got to tell you guys, my, it appears my baby son, who by the way is about to turn one years old. Uh, he'll be turning one yeah. tomorrow, which is, I can't believe. It's, oh, it's is it tomorrow? My, yeah. Oh, well, that's wow. yeah, that actual birthday, right? Um, he looks like he inherited my dancing ability. So oh, kinda, yeah, wow. So, so terrible. Right? No <laughs> <laughs> we'll play music. He's so funny. We'll play music and this is how he dances. The music will go on and I think he thinks he's a DJ. He puts his hand in the air. He's one. And he'll... <laughs> no, <laughs> he's, he's, that's all he does, dude. I think, I, I think I've seen up. you do that in the club before. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the move. Yeah. If you next, don't know how to dance... Next with the fist yeah. and he just pumps. Yeah. Yeah. Always the have ceiling. a drink so that the other hand doesn't have to do anything and then the other just, hand does this <laughs> and then you don't really have to move much. But it's wow. so funny. We'll put music on and you'll look and he, what he does is he'll look for one of us, look at us in the eye and then he'll go... While he's laughing, <laughs> oh, dying of laughter because oh, he's doing the DJ dance. Bro, you got to make a video with that. That'd be yeah. amazing. Uh, I think I have one. Bro, this I is a fun. This is where it gets fun, man. So one, fun. One, well, I really felt like w about the one year, even a little bit before, so you're already going through it, right? That Like one on like all the little milestones Dude, and the- His language- They're little humans now, you know? Oh, so he, so we, I told you we taught him sign language things. Yeah. So that's coming out like crazy. And words now. So he tries to say, I love you. That's wow. a that's full on like three wow. three words you know that he puts yeah. in a little sentence, so it's pretty crazy. How long till it's like forget about it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I gotta tell you guys this is hilarious. So Jessica's one of her best friends came over our house the other day, the other day, and she has two boys. So she has a four year old and a one and a almost one and a half year old. Now the one and a half year old is because he's got a four year old brother. Like the kid is tough, right? Because his four year old brother is always messing with him, pushing him down, wrestling with him. So he's got experience. My son has zero experience with any kind of like like rough housing or just yeah. like me play. But I'm dad, right? Yeah. Or his older brother. So she brings her kids over, and the one and a half year old that she has, this kid is like physically gifted. At eight months old, he was walking, so he's running and climbing, and doing stuff. My son's still learning how to, you know, he's he pushes a sled or whatever. Like a, he has a little walker, but he doesn't know how to walk on his own. So they're playing. And every once in a while, this kid will like knock him over. Yeah, like push him, <laughs> or like, to, and you can tell my, my so my son will look at us confused, like, you know. And Jessica wants to go rescue. I'm like, well, let's see what happens. I want to see what he, you know, kind of what's going on. And he'll make this face like he's kind of anyway. At one point, the kid and him were fighting over a toy or kind of whatever, and the kid he hit my son in the face, oh. and my son was shocked. And he looks at Jessica, and he's like. You know, he starts crying and I'm cracking up. I'm like, oh, no, he doesn't know. He doesn't know what to do. Yeah. Anyway, as the night progressed, I think he started to figure it out a little bit. So we're sitting down. I'm playing with both of them. And I've got this little toy that I spin. And my son goes to grab it. And the other kid takes it real quick. So my son looks at him in the face and screams. Rah! And then the other kid screams back. Rah! And then my son grabs his leg and he's like, oh, and I'm like, oh he's trying to fight back. So he's like, right, it doesn't. <laughs> I love watching this kind of stuff. It's so funny. <laughs> it's so private. We were, I know, we, it's so you know, funny. We had Max. We took Max to the park not that long ago. You just reminded me of a story that I, I didn't share before. That I, I, It was an interesting first time I'd ever seen this happen. 
And this, we were at, we're walking to the park. It's a really busy park. And there's this kid who's kind of running around by himself. He's probably four or five. And he's at that age where like he's learning his voice and he likes, to, you know, like when kids <laughs> yeah. start to like growl like a dinosaur really loud and they just like yeah. scream like that. And we were walking by and he did that to Max and Max stopped to watch him. And, he, and the kid obviously saw that Max was engaged and he was yeah. paying attention. And at first Max was like, oh, this is cool. And the kid just kept getting louder and louder until like you Max, want a reaction? Yeah, Max started crying. <laughs> it's like he, did, he went from like, oh, this is really interesting to like, this is not cool what at all. And this? just starts <laughs> crying out of nowhere. And, and Katrina species. wanted to console him. Right. And I said, relax. It's good. He'll be okay. Just, you know, it's interacting with kids. It's, yeah. You know what I'm saying? That's It's interesting to watch them when they go from that age of not being around they that start to figure kids. it out though yeah that's you, what i'm and saying you have to let them kind of do oh that. as the night progressed i just I, like i said i watched my son like he, he like got aggressive and grabbed his leg and he does this thing whenever he can't move something he like summons his strength that's what i call it he like tenses up and he yeah. does this thing and it cracks me up it's the funniest face but he, did, up. he grabbed the kid's leg and he's like <laughs> i was like oh no he figured out that he's got to fight back a little bit so i separated them a little bit yeah <laughs> man it was it was uh, it was pretty funny. Did you guys take it? Did you guys actually take him out trick or treating? We, did you go anywhere? We anything? did. We we. Uh, I mean, he's, I didn't do anything at one. We so, didn't take him out anywhere. So we did it just to, for fun, right? So okay. we put him in a wagon. He dressed up as uh, God. What was that? You were a firefighter, and then a seven no, dwarfs, right? No, he was dopey. So yeah, we had yeah, two dude. costumes, but the firefighter one, it, it was too cold and it looked like a it was like a stripper firefighter. I looked. I looked, I looked, I looked, I looked <laughs> <laughs> he's got suspenders and no <laughs> shirt on. You know, what is ladies. He's, yeah. he's too for the you were you were in the conversation with Sal and I were talking about this because Katrina Katrina was Minnie Mouse and uh -huh. she's like yeah I almost got like the slutty costume I was like oh thank god you didn't do that I said you're a mom now I said we do not want to look back at pictures with our son she's when he's holding the baby. 16 and you got your tits hanging out like that's I love that honey like you know seven eight years ago and stuff I'm, I was all pro that but yeah. not not for you know what, family photos anymore. yeah we retired the Wonder Woman <laughs> slutty costume yeah, yeah. and I was like depressed about it for a bit but you're right it's yeah. just not <laughs> yeah. the same now it's private it's yeah. a private costume yeah, yeah exactly yeah, we yeah. save it for later you yeah. know what just cracks me up about all the fitness influencers it's like they pick a costume that gives them an excuse to oh, yeah. like take their shirt off I mean off. I'm like, just as guilty of that I'm gonna be, I mean, I'm done, gonna be the every, whole every year yeah. that I'm jacked I've done yeah. costumes that are of like of course you see, what's the least amount yeah. of stuff I could put yeah, on I'm sure you did the warrior so and many the Hulk. slutty I, cops out there I didn't I never did the Hulk but I did the Spartan I did Ultimate Warrior you know actually those are probably the only two where I was like that where I was like but they were great. They were homemade costumes. Yeah, too. so we took him in a wagon, and he was kind of confused, but happy not to be in bed. So he's kind of like, you know, looking around. Yeah. And then we'd go up to the house, say trick or treat, and the person would hand him the candy. And you could tell he's like, why? Uh, okay. And he'd like grab it, and then he'd just give it to his mom. He has no idea there's candy in there. I think he thinks... He's just getting shiny wrappers. Yeah, he's his toys. That's what yeah. Max thought it was. He thought it was all toy. Everybody was like, oh my God, you let him go trick or treat? I'm like, yeah. Ugh. And they're like, well, what did you do with all the candy? I said, I threw it away that night. Yeah. I said, he, he collected all of it. He had such a blast with the process. So he thought it was so, he, he mm -hmm. figured out how to knock on the door and he got to put the candy in there and people were all nice to him. And so he had a blast. In fact, <laughs> yesterday we had a hard time because we went outside and he wanted to go knock on everybody's door again because we did that just the other day. Awesome. So, so now he wants to go walk to all the neighbors and he was like, ah! <laughs> Let me go. <laughs> like, dude, Max, they're not going to just keep giving you candy. Every single you know, day, so. Halloween has changed a lot. Every it, day. It used to be, and I realized this uh, with one of our staff members talked about how they had 200 people yeah. go by their house. Wow. It, it, now, Halloween used to be that you stayed in your neighborhood and mm -hmm. it was an annual way of seeing your neighbors. Right. Now, people don't do that. They no. drive to the neighborhoods they want to trick or treat. Oh, so I mean, I, we did that. We, anyway. we did that too, bro. We, I, we we'd find that. the ones with the king size yes. options. See, that's what I said to him. He said that yesterday and I was like, you wait, you drove to oh, the yeah. neighborhoods? I'm I mean, going, not me. I wasn't dude. old enough to drive, but we would have our mom. Pillow like, cases full. Yeah, we, knew all, we knew the rich neighborhoods were as a yeah. kid. I mean, as a kid. I never did that. I always stayed in our neighborhood. I mean, I did in our neighborhood for like a minute just as like a warm up. Yeah. yeah. Oh, so and I, I didn't know this. Well, I was always on the other side of the tracks, right? So we definitely you ain't going in your head. We get a bunch of those Tootsie Rolls. You know what I'm saying? You get like Funyuns. Yeah, you get the fucking know, single Tootsie just... Rolls. You got 400 of those walking around that neighborhood. <laughs> hey, hey Tootsie tell Rolls suck. Take me to the golf course. I want the just, king size. Just a big bag of Doritos. They give you one. <laughs> yeah. There's one for you. I got a bunch more for yeah, the next kid dude, that comes yeah. in. Yeah. So, no, we we learned that pretty early. And uh, we'd ask our moms to take us over to the, like, there was a golf course right near in the town. You get like those those old lady mints. You know, yeah, like we yeah. I like those. those. Yeah, but like when you're a kid, you're like, eh. you know what's <laughs> funny? I liked, I like, and I still like the shitty Halloween. Candy. I was just gonna ask you guys, what like, is? It's funny you brought. This I love candy, candy, candy corn. corn. Okay, nobody does candy corn. What anymore. is? Yeah, what them. is? What is a weird candy that most people don't like that you guys like? Candy corn and circus peanuts. Circus uh, peanuts are like the marshmallow peanuts. fake looking peanut. 
It's like a big kind of like pink. Oh, those are yeah, gross. They're those. like it's like an off color like pink. Or, yes. Oh wow. I like that and candy. Those corn. are terrible. Those are my favorite. That's a good example. Though. I know. I know. That is a weird. Did one. you go those little root beer gummy things? Those are good. Oh, those are good. Oh, whatever. Those are good. Did, did, okay. okay. Like okay, that, is a, good, a that is a That is a good example. That yeah. is like a terrible candy that most people would throw yeah. away, and you like that. What about this? You guys ever get the flavored wax? Oh yeah. The, oh yeah. Like the lips. Disgusting. The yeah. Does anybody like that? Like that? I like that. You what the hell is that? It. Yeah, yeah. I did chew. like that. What do you that. do with it? I don't know. You just chew it I up. Don't know. And you then can, you spit it out. No, can you, you can eat them. I think you could actually eat them. You swallow it. Yeah. And then you, what do you poop out a candle? <laughs> yeah, you do. Yeah. Yeah. You definitely do. Yeah. Uh, I tried. That's what. That's a weird one that I think yeah. comes out. Yeah. Dude, cylindrically. Dude, speaking of neighbors, I had such an embarrassing thing happen last night. So we have yet. So we moved to a new neighborhood a few months ago, and I haven't really met too many of my neighbors yet. Right. Um. So I haven't really met too many aside from like the occasional, you know, wave or whatever. Anyway, we put the baby to bed, seven o'clock. Usually by 8.30, Jessica and I are in our room, winding down, getting ready to go to bed within an hour or so because we, we need to go to bed early because the baby wakes up or whatever. So I'm in my sweats and shirts off and Jessica's getting ready, washing her face, whatever. We have no, no lights are on downstairs and I hear a knock on the door. I'm like, knock on the, who the hell's knocking on my door at this time, feeling like it's late, it's only 8.30. And so instinctually, as a dad, knock on the door, I'm already like, who's at my door, right? So I walk <laughs> down there and I open the door. I got no shirt on. I got my pants kind of like sagging or whatever. It's my neighbor. Oh, hey, welcome to the neighborhood. I'm like, oh God, I look like such a douchebag. <laughs> hey, you my neighbor? Yeah. How's it going? You're Sorry, just scratching I was, yourself. <laughs> I was just doing push-ups anyway. Yeah, yeah. So what's going on? <laughs> it was nice to meet someone like that, but I'm sure I gave the wrong impression by answering yeah, yeah. the door that way. Next thing you know, the neighbor's got binoculars, you know, and you're just like, wait yeah. a minute. It was <laughs> the wife too. You know, the husband. Uh -huh. So what'd you think of the neighbors? Um, uh, well, yeah, oh, she cool. knew what she was doing there. No, yeah. it's terrible. She's already attracted us. Yeah. You know, Sal walks around shirtless yeah. about that time or yeah. so. God, so <laughs> embarrassing. Yeah. Hey, speaking, of, uh, we earlier we talked about tech. I wanted to bring this up. Do you guys see what Elon, did we talk about what Elon said to the Yeah, UN? yeah, we talked we, about We talked about all that, right? Yeah, we didn't talk about the forum. The forum responded to it. Someone posted that. And so, then, you know what makes me upset about this is that people don't realize how complex some of the, these issues are and how you can't just solve them. Yeah, by throwing money at them. They well, haven't they already solve. tried that, right? Didn't didn't isn't there like a, you know, there's billions of dollars that are going well, towards not only that, that. it's just not successful? Yeah, we like uh, when we're talking to what's the big pygmy his his yes. handle, what's his name again? Is oh, it, God. the big pygmy is his actual handle, but yeah. it's Justin Wren. Justin Thank Wren. You. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, good job, Adam. Yeah, good job. Adam got that one. Um, well, just like what do you Why do you guys talk so fucking surprised that I like, <laughs> what the fuck was that? You catch that? Bro, is that, oh wow, good job! Listen, oh wow, you know something. I'm what sorry, the but fuck is that? <laughs> Jesus, we throw a lot of uh, fillers your, your way <laughs> most of the time. So that you was, remembered something? Yeah, yeah that wow. Was, sorry, I, <laughs> I mean, did you feel that? I felt that. Did you feel that? We, I felt that. Hey but, man, um, we're being positive. No, we're being. Go ahead, trying finish, to hey, finish, finish, your, finish your story. Anyway, go back to negative. What right? I'm trying to say <laughs> is like just you know. A lot of the money for charity that was like being infused in, um, you, you know, people like in, in certain dire situations, like it doesn't always help. Like you're, he found out that it like it actually ruined the the natural economy that they were building yes. together. Oh yeah, oh and, yeah, yeah. So the way that they would exchange goods and everything, like just because now they're getting all this free stuff coming in, like ruins that whole like interaction and then created a whole new problem. Do you know how many places got tremendous tremendous amount of global aid for food, but then it crushed their local uh, farming communities? Yes. And generations of people forgot how to grow rice and farm. And then they became dependent. Now, I'm not saying not to help, but I think this it's is- It's just more complicated than that is what yes. you're saying is you just don't understand that. Like people don't think like that. They think, oh my God, these people they don't think have- money will solve it. They don't have a lot of food over here. So let's just send crates of all these food. Or just give not them realizing money. that there's actually four local grocery stores that actually get provided by the farms that are also local that mm -hmm. feed or that sell that stuff to that- that community that you now just took away their, their business for the next three months because well, you'd send all that. It's, it's not, look, I'll, I'll make it simple. I, imagine if there was a problem in our business. We're trying to figure something out with the, and we don't know how to solve it. Right. So someone just gives us a million dollars. And you just spend money on the wrong solutions. Right. It's just going to waste uh, a bunch of money. You actually see this a lot in education. You mm -hmm. see money being thrown at education a lot and not seeing any real positive returns because. We're not, we haven't figured out how to solve the issue. Rather, we just think it's a money issue. Now, I'm not saying money can't solve things. It can. But if you don't know what the solution is, just throwing money at the problem doesn't help. In fact, often, oftentimes what it does is enriches the people who pretend to know how to help. Right. So like you talked about those charities, 
Do you know how many times money would come from you know countries like ours to these other countries and just end up enriching these people that control certain things over yes, there? Yes, the bureaucrats or the people that are taking all the money to distribute it from yeah. there, which they're ending up you know filling their pockets. Oh, it's uh, it's so in, like ah, oh, enrages me. Yeah, so pr complex issues you got to figure out solutions before you just spend a ton of money on them. And Elon illuminated that. He said, all right, I got $6 billion, but you got to yeah. make it public. Yeah. Talk about how you spend every single cent. Yes. And then I'll do it. Crickets. Nothing but transparency, which is, again, in my opinion, I would love that if we could have that kind of like uh, transparency they, they don't want government that. spending. They don't want that because then they got to show how much money the bureaucracy Yeah, you got to see who you're throwing the kickbacks to and all these other like- uh, <clears throat> And yeah. the waste- you know, just too many, too many other like variables in there. They don't want you. To see. I thought it was interesting that he said that. And we had somebody in our forum post it be like, oh, this is, you know, Elon Musk is badass. Right. And then we had somebody else who responded that like, I don't understand why this statement is, is so badass. Why is Elon Musk badass? And I went off and listed like three reasons why I think this statement yeah, or he can do like so many things you can't do. Yeah. I just, I, I mean, to me, I, I see that. I don't know. It's, it's, it's interesting to me how some people view somebody who has had that has a, a, a accumulated that much wealth. We, a, a lot, a, this generation coming up now, I mean, I feel like it's the generation coming up now because I feel like anybody who's older than 40 or 50 years old would see something like that and be inspired or it would be revered for the fact that they were able to build something of that magnitude right. where there's this now this thing of like- It's the AOC culture, like all rich people are evil or something. Yeah. Well, I, okay, I'll take it a step further. They, they, most people who think that would not say that about a successful athlete or musician. So if I did a post that said, uh, you know, LeBron James, uh, you know, he doesn't deserve to get paid that much. I bet a lot of those same people would be like, well, of course he does. Look how good he is. I've seen him play. He's such an amazing player. But if I say the CEO of Walmart or the CEO of McDonald's or Elon Musk, oh, well, they don't deserve any of that stuff. Part of it is they don't see the game being played right in front of them. They don't see the innovation and the capital risk and the work that's involved. Whereas with an athlete, it looks, they can kind of see why, oh, it makes sense why LeBron makes so much money, or it makes sense why Adele makes so much money. But it's, it's for the most part, uh, you know, Elon has innovated so much and has contributed so much to, and I'm not saying he's a God or he's an angel. I, I don't know. I don't know the guy. So his character, he could be an asshole for all I care, but for all I know, but the fact that the fact is he's innovated so much, he's contributed so much to society that people have willingly Giving the guy billions of dollars, yeah. Yeah. so that's got to say something, you know. About or how about done. the amount? Of, I mean, I always think it's so funny coming from somebody who is either one probably never created a job for somebody else in their life before. Well, th that's the point. Who's talking down about somebody who is potentially? I, I don't even know how People many don't thousands, know how, hard that how is. many thousands of jobs that he's created by his wealth, his ability to go make that much money has provided a, a, a living for thousands of people. That's crazy. Well, to that point, let's say like you've like learned a musical instrument, right? When you're a kid and you've gone through that. And so you have this sort of, wow, this is hard to get really good at it. And you see somebody at the top of this is getting paid a lot of money. You're like, that makes sense, yeah. right? Or like you're an athlete and, and you see this like specimen, you know, professional athlete. And you're like, of course they should get paid all this money. But there is just not enough people that have tried to start their own business. Right. They just have no idea how incredibly difficult it is. All the odds are against you. It's insane, especially here in California. I mean, I am impressed with small business that have survived this. One hundred percent. I think. I mean, and one of the like the one of the, the things that I, I don't talk about or share that uh, I know Katrina and I talk about, but one of the things that I'm very proud of that we have done is actually the jobs that we've created. And it's barely anything compared to someone like, you know, the fact that we have provided a living for, you know, 12 or 13 people from something that was just the four of us one day that decided to start this, to build this thing. I, I, I have so much pride in that. I feel like that that I get more excited about that than I do the actual percentage of growth we did last month or how much revenue that we're making. It's like the fact that we are able to eat and live off of this business and we have now been able to create 13 jobs that just eight years ago did not exist that that's fucking that and it took my whole life to get to this level that i even had the skill sets to be able to do that so when i see somebody man or woman that has built something to this magnitude yeah i, it, I it's nothing about their it's, care i don't i can't speak to their character and what they do behind closed doors they've done a lot of things right to it's, get there it's yeah. politics it's politicians fault they they it's their job to sell that they have easy solutions 
And the easy solutions typically look like this. All we need is the money to fix the problem. Don't worry, you don't have to pay for it. The billionaire or the millionaire. Yeah, but I don't like I don't like the, the scapegoat of, of politicians. I mean, that you as a as a, a you know person in society who's consuming that that content and that narrative, it's your fault for buying into that bullshit. Oh yeah, I mean of course. Because it's not. I mean, but I'm, if you're sold that so often, you you start to believe. It. I'll never forget the time my mom revealed this to me. We were literally driving, and we were going to Disneyland, and I remember seeing like many, several liquor stores, one after another. And I remember telling my mom, why are there so many liquor stores one after another? Are they, are they just trying to get people to drink alcohol and smoke cigarettes? And she goes, no. She goes, they would not exist if people didn't go and buy their products. Mm -hmm. So they're only there because of the demand. And if people didn't buy their products, it wouldn't be. I remember as a kid, I sat back and literally just thought for like two hours for the rest of the trip wow, like all the stuff that we don't like or that we get angry at, the, the tabloids and stuff, that's us. Like we're the ones that are buying that. If we just stop buying it, it wouldn't it wouldn't exist anymore. Yeah. And, you know, people in very high levels, they did something that lots of people liked because we gave them a lot of money. And a, another one is this, is like, there are definitely jobs that we, that we revere that we don't understand why they don't make more money. A lot of it has to do with the fact that we just don't revere them as much as we think we do. Like, we talk about how much teachers need to make more, but if we really revered them as much as we thought we did, we would choose to pay them more. And then the other thing is there's a lot of people willing to be teachers, not a lot of people who can, you know, kick a football 50, you know, yards or whatever and, and, and make a field goal. So there's some realities that we need to face. I'm so glad you nailed that analogy. You did, you did. So, you like and that? 50's a pretty good long kick. Yards. Although, that's a very long kick. Although the record was yeah. hit this year. You know that? 60, what was it, 64? 64 yards? 64, 64, 66. Okay. It just happened this year. I got a little football. I don't know the guy's name, but the old record, or one of the longest standing record for field goals was a guy who played for, I want to say, the Packers. Barefoot? And he had half a foot. On one foot, he had a club foot. What was that guy? Am I right? Did I hit that? Like shoeless. Oh, uh, yeah. I don't know. No name. foot, Joe. No. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Maybe I Doug can find out. Like <laughs> I watched the NFL films once, and I remember this. Uh, Clubber Lane McGain. Yeah, yeah. no. Clubber yeah. Lane was the fight. Was Tom was. Dempsey. Oh, oh there it is. Dempsey. I swear Could to God, I Dem do that. Dempsey's a good old uh, name. Who kicked the field goal record this year? So I think it's sixty-six or sixty-four yards, one or the other. It happened this year. I watched it live. I can't remember. What that's it was. Uh, that's incredible. Yeah, it was when you see how far that is and how hard oh, yeah. it is. Yeah, 66 yards. It was 66. And okay. what's the guy's name? Justin Tucker. Oh, what a good job. What a good yeah. name. I like that. Justin, yeah. since your name just come up, I want to yeah. ask you a question. Yeah, dude. What's up with everybody, uh, the confusion around your favorite flavor of Magic Spoon? I heard you talking this morning and you yeah. were like, why do every, why does everybody think my favorite flavor well, is peanut butter? Well, I think I mentioned it once <laughs> that like I liked peanut butter, but honestly, my favorite's still fruity. Okay. So I have to clear the air. Peanut butter is not even my top three. What? No. I mean, I do like to, I like incorporating it with chocolate because I'm a, okay, so back to Halloween, right? So you, you like sprinkle it on your Hershey's? Yeah, dude, I uh, like, I would collect from, and my kids know too that like I have this obsession with like peanut butter and chocolate is the only candy I even like. Yeah. Like, I don't even like because all this other stuff just hurts my teeth. I'm just like, this doesn't give me the kind of reward. <laughs> it's more pain than reward, you yeah. know? So they're like out collecting everybody's like Reese's and like giving it to me, like some kind of offering. So that way they can eat their candy. Andy, you know, <laughs> get dad happy. Yeah, exactly. Get oh, your dad. They're like, <laughs> uh, so they figured that one out. But um, I've I've actually I've incorporated both like the chocolate and the peanut butter together. And I started doing that a lot more frequently. So what do you, you take a box of chocolate? Yeah, magic spoon to mix it with the peanut. It's, oh, I haven't done that. It's a friendship. Maybe they should do that. It's pretty good. Maybe they should do that. Yeah, that sounds like I like that one again. Fruity is my favorite, but uh, I just think that formulation has just been, and they've they've redone it they've like once or twice, fruity. and they totally perfected it. No, I think that uh, the other ones are close, but like I think they're still kind of working. It I out. still trip out over the macros. I can't believe it's got that much. Pro it's a freaking protein shake in a bowl. It's so that good, dude. Like candy, and and I don't care amazing. what people. Say, it's so good. You know, talking about candy. Did you guys see the tweet that our our buddy uh, uh, Ryan Mickler did from Order of Man? Did you see his tweet the, yesterday? The dad uh, tax. Yes. Yeah. Thirty yeah. percent. It's our it's our duty as fathers during Halloween to take 30% of our kids candy <laughs> and teach them about taxes. That's hilarious. <laughs> yes. That's totally that's a, a, agree. So, I have to say. That's uh, funny. I've done that. Just yeah. like, I'll, I'll just do a flyby. Yeah. This is the thing that I do with my kids all the time. If they have something I want, I'll just be like, taxes. And I'll just grab it. <laughs> did, you, did you know, by the way, that there has never once been a real case of a kid getting a weed edible in their candy? Even though, have you guys seen all the fun? Oh, watch out. Oh, or have, a razor blade. that they. Uh, oh, they're going to put like, 
Ain't nobody giving free edibles away. It's like to your all kid, the urban legends. Yeah, yeah, dude, you're not gonna yeah. find no drug addict is giving up. You ain't gonna their, find or, or drugs. Stoner is gonna give up their. Come on, their bro. Yeah, you know right. what I mean? Oh yeah, shit, expensive. Not by purpose, at least. You know what I'm yeah. saying? They accidentally, maybe they were high and they're like, "Oh shit, I gave them the wrong bag." <laughs> 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 they, they they certainly are not like handing out. Like, someone, that's not a malt. malt? That's gonna be expensive candy uh, to be, uh, yeah, to be handed out. Man, to Timmy slept hard last night. That kid was in bed till you know. I tell you what, though, Adam and I are probably more aligned with candy than almost anything else, I would say, because you just said straight up candy hurts your teeth and stuff. I don't like it, dude. I yeah. feel like a Adam and I could eat just pure sugar, shitty yeah, sugar I know. candy. I mean, I used to like that. You I used to like the that. pixie, oh, love it. straight sugar. You're like, like the good and plenty guy, right? Uh, you know, yeah, I did like, I mean, I like all, I like most candy and I haven't had candy in a long time. Obviously, we went, that Halloween happened. So I, it's. And I don't know, this is me and and uh, I'm just by myself on this or what, but I guess because I, I've done this enough times where I completely eliminate something out of my diet, then I allow it in, eliminate it, and I've, like, I'm always yeah. paying attention to like my behaviors. It is wild to me how I can have like a, a piece or two of candy that like, let's say it was on the counter that last night or whatever. And now- for the next three hours while I'm like watching TV. Craving. All, and it's like- It's a trigger. Yeah. And then I go back and it's Same. like, oh, I'll just have a couple more. And then it's Same. like, oh, then I go back, it's a couple more. And then before, then all of a sudden I go to bed, I'm like, oh, why did I do that? Terrible. I, that happened to us. And we were- I'm so aware and I still yeah. do it. We, well, were up so in, we were up in Truckee and we were all hang, working late and Adam's like, I got, he comes up to me and he goes, I got a stash of candy. I'm like, what? <laughs> And he goes up. I didn't know I love this. that he's found his other source because he gets me on ice cream. Bro, <laughs> I did not know. I know Adam. Yeah, like, I know who to work. <laughs> Adam likes. To, he always <laughs> takes someone along. Right? Here's his. Uh, he goes up and find and pulls out this point. bag, and literally in the bag is like little fun size. You like, know that was Starburst. from you know that's from Halloween the previous okay. year, right? So what I was gonna say yeah, is I pulled garbage. it out yeah, and yeah. I pulled out the Starburst and I opened it up. It and probably it, tasted terrible, I, and it looked like it was old as shit. Yeah, but guess what I did? Ate them all anyway. Yeah, I know. And felt I did the same thing with it because that that bag is literally from. Uh, last Tasty year, wax. last Halloween. Um, oh, it was like, it was like, you know, Starburst is soft. It was crunchy. Yeah. That's how long it'd been out. For. And you still, I did the same thing. I uh, had one. I'm like, oh, this is terrible. Here, I'll have another one. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Keep Dude. it going. Maybe the next one will be different. Hey, you <laughs> but know now you wonder how, why, I mean, this is why I'm so adamant about this when I'm training a client to eliminate certain things like that. And this is also why um, I like us to challenge, you know, and I love Lane and I love the information he presents, but I know he, he talks, he always is trying to preach the message about it. Oh, in, in the context of a calorie deficit, uh, sugar is yeah, fine. Yeah, but behaviors are everything. Yeah, but behaviors is everything. And it's like, I know this about myself. I know this about my clients. Most people that struggle with weight gain probably have can relate some level or not what with what I'm talking about. And so you just got to take that into account. Like that very few people are taking out a, a pack of nerds and they're weighing it in the on the scale and going like, oh, there's 1.2 ounces. That puts me at 100 calorie deficit. Still, I'm going to eat that. Like who eats candy like that? No one. No one eats candy like <laughs> no, that. No, it's a, it's, a, it's definitely a trigger. I'll, yeah. You know what? Speaking al along the lines of like loving and eating things or whatever. So obviously my baby son really never has eaten real candy before. But do you know that? Okay, so Serenity Kids, right? This is a company that we work with. They make baby food. And it's the best. I've never seen baby food as good as this one in terms of the ingredients. You look at grass-fed meat made with bone broth, organic, grain-free, you know, you name it, whatever. But they make this product called Puffs. I think they're called Puffs. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. The little, the, like, rice puffs? Or the, no. Yeah. What is they're made out of? They're grain-free. Oh, so grain they free? use, uh, what is that starch, that starchy, it's it's not a, it's not a grain. It couscous? does look it up. Not couscous. Uh, no, no, no. It's something else. But it's made with bone broth. That particular ingredient, which I'll have Doug look up right now, and some other stuff. The ingredients are really good. It's got protein in it. <clears throat> and it's it's like those little treats that you yeah, put in your dissolve, mouth dissolve. and they dissolve. Yeah, yeah. Dude, my son will lose his shit over it. Yeah. Like, we have to hide the container after we give him some because he'll go nuts. What is that? It's got cassava flour. Cassava. Oh, cassava And flour. tapioca starch. That's it. And then what are the other ingredients in there, Doug? Olive oil, pumpkin powder, sweet potato powder, carrot powder. And then some cinnamon and other. Oh, that's one things. flavor. Yeah, yeah the, the one we do Dude, also. Cassava flour tortillas are bomb. They're oh, actually not bad, them. right? I've yeah, never had them oh, they're really good. Yeah, yeah they're I, not bad at all. I can totally really? converted mm -hmm. to those. Totally. But anyway, my he he freaks out. It's like his favorite uh, thing. Max in the world. loves it too. Have you got him one of those little uh, cups where he can put his hand? That's in? the one we use. Yeah, yeah. It, and it, sometimes he's lucky, so it's like you know, usually you only get one out, and it yeah. takes some time. Dude, he gets some. Sometimes he'll get four yeah, out. Yeah, then they go flying. All oh over no, I'll 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 look at him, and he's got his whole mouth is full. You know, and he's yeah. like looking at me and I'm like, you got like five in your mouth. Yeah, yeah, buddy. Yeah. He loves them. And he also likes the grass fed uh, beef. 
packet one. Oh, uh, the squeezy one, right? That goes nuts. Yeah, the squeezy, the squeezies, and then the puffins or whatever. Because puffins, I think, is actually the the. It's called puffs. Yeah, the I think puffins are the generic brand that, or not the generic, the original brand that started doing that right. first. Really? Yeah, but that has all the process. Yeah, it has, it has a bunch of stuff in it. Version. Where this is their this is their version of that, and he absolutely loves those. Yeah, so it's called puffs. Okay, yeah. so it's pumpkin and cinnamon, carrot, beet, uh, broccoli. And, so he likes the the tomato and mushroom. That's what my you know my favorite thing about Serenity Kids is that so um, we were before we even found Serenity, we were doing those all those uh, you know squeezy packet things. Yeah. What, I don't mm -hmm. know what the hell you call those, right? Where they like basically puree all the the food and they put in there. Did you know that other brands don't do like beef and chicken and meat? No. It's all uh, sugars. It's, it's all fruit. Yes, it's yeah. all fruit and vegetables. And they they promote it and sell it as like a health food. But I'm like, I flip it around. And I'm like, dude, this is loaded oh, yes. full of sugar. So when we use them, it's like, like I'm always telling Katrina, I'm like, do the ones from Serenity that have the meat in them that are way better for them than the other ones that are just a bunch of they sugar. They have salmon. They have beef. Yeah. They have uh, bison. So mm -hmm. my son likes bison and beef. Yeah. And goes nuts for them. So we save them for when we travel. Because otherwise we make his own food. We blend it and, mm. uh, you know, in a blender or whatever. So, but he loves them. So they're doing it. They're kicking ass. But those puffs, I tell you, there's something, something about them that's hyper palatable because he will he will fight for them. So we have to literally hide the container. Speaking of kicking out, are you are you still following um, the stock market and Bitcoin and stuff right now? It's like just is Bitcoin still crushing? Still running like really? Yeah, like crazy. No, I got to check right now. Where's it at right now? Uh, the last I uh, last I looked, it was at sixty. Would you say Sal sixty two or it's last sixty six? I think at one yeah, point it, just, it it's got wow. to insane right now. Oh wow, look at that. Oh no, it's just, yeah, look at that. It's uh, it's it's at sixty three. That's uh, pretty high. I don't know if that's the highest. No, at one point it got up to 64. Was there recent news or anything that drove this? Uh, yeah, they were going to start trading. Something having to do with it, uh, with uh, traders being able to use it in a particular way. I don't remember exactly. What well, you also have lenders that are actually allowing it to to be uh, to pay for mortgages through, with Bitcoin. Shut so your face. Yes. So you have uh, some lenders now. You one, of the, one of the largest okay. lenders in the country are accepting Bitcoin as their as a mortgage payment. Now they didn't get a, a ton, so it was like it was a test program that they ran out to see how many people would actually pay that way. But they accepted it. So if you had Bitcoin, I think they had a, a small percentage of no people way. actually doing it. Now here's the interesting part that I, when I was reading this article, that is going to be like I'm really curious to like how this is going to unfold. Now, everybody has had everybody in here has a friend or someone they know who like swears by all the money they've made from Bitcoin, right? <laughs> yeah, I know, isn't that obnoxious? It, it, it's, 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 it's like everybody does, yeah. right? Everybody has that one. My buddy just texted me someone someone it's who works Ferrari. works at a, a car dealership who is quitting his job because he invested thirty thousand dollars in Bitcoin over the last year and a half or so, and he's cashing out twenty five million. Oh my God. Right. So, I mean, everybody has a story like this of somebody who's now making all this money off of crypto. Now, uh, one of the things that I was reading in the article is that anytime that crypt, uh, crypto is used to buy something, it triggers an audit because it's it, for capital gains. Because they're assuming, obviously, if someone is using it to purchase, using it as purchasing power for anything mm -hmm. like that, that they've made money off of trading it. It's and the so, tax, man. So that's mm -hmm. where I'm, you know, it's going to be really interesting to see how the IRS gets after. Oh, they'll uh, get their, they're going to want to get their hands on it. Yeah. So I think that's one thing if you are into that space right now and you're you're making moves consistently. I'd, I'd definitely be concerned with, <clears throat> about that. Yeah, no, that would worry me too. Hey, what's up, fit and healthy people? Look, real quick, before we get to the rest of the show, if you're fit and healthy, you probably want your kids and your babies to be fit and healthy, but you don't want to give them the garbage baby food that is out there. Most of it's crap, packed full of sugar, hyper-processed, not healthy. Well, there is one company that's doing it different. It's Serenity Kids. They use things like grass-fed and grass-finished beef, grain-free snacks, uh, bone broth, you know, they use sweet potato and vegetables like spinach and broccoli. Very healthy stuff, healthy fats, high in protein. It's the only baby food that I feed my one-year-old son. Go check them out, right? Head over to MySerenityKids.com and then use the code MP20 for 20% off. All right, here's the rest of the show. Our first caller is Sierra from California. Hey, what's up, Sierra? How can we help you? Hi guys. Thanks for having me on. I'll just broken record it like everyone else. I love y'all's podcast and I appreciate all the content. Thank you. Um, my question today is about juggling um, my love for fitness and working out um, and just looking physically fit 
along with the demanding schedule of being a pro NBA dancer. Um, I have danced for a very long time. I danced collegiately throughout college. And then um, I moved from Tennessee over to the West Coast where I joined a pro NBA dance team. And at the same time, I also really love working out. I just love lifting. I love getting strong. It makes me feel confident and just great. Um, But with the schedule of uh, NBA dancer, it is very demanding. We have um, three practices a week that are about four hours long, mostly in the, in the nighttime. So like seven to like midnight. Um, and then we also have games on top of that. Game days are very long. Um, so I'm trying to figure out what the ideal way to like work out and have like performance for my, um, dance team commitments at the same time. Um, I typically stay between like 20 to 24% body fat, but like in my off season, but when like the season starts, I don't know. It's, it's just hard to like get nutrition and workouts and practice all within like a 24 hour span of a day in order for me to like look the physically fit physique that I'm supposed to, to like stay on court and like look good in my uniforms. So just kind of wondering what you guys' ideas on that might be. I've tried a few different things, of course, like I just bounce around <laughs> um, and I just thought I'd get you guys' input. Okay. And that's a good question. You're doing a lot right now. So you said three practices for four hours plus, plus games. games, which are longer. How many days a week are you doing other workouts on top of that? Um, I have a split that it's typically five days, but now it's four days. I have a four oh, day wow. split. And they end up being like a total body. I have like quads and arms. I have like shoulders and glutes. Yeah. Um, so I usually have like an upper lower, but now I've kind of done a little bit of a total body ish, but a little more nuanced um, on top of that. Yeah. This, oh, is, this is easy help, right? Yeah. You, you got to li- your lift. You're doing way too much. I, honestly, with that <laughs> practice uh, schedule, because that's 12 one. hours a week of movement and basically cardio and movement. I'm sure there's a lots of explosive movements in there. I mean, it's, it's, it's dancing, which is a hard workout plus games. You shouldn't be lifting more than one or two days a week, four to five days a week of lifting on top of that is just too much, way too much. And that's what you're feeling right now. I, honestly, if you lifted, you're, you're going to see your, your physique is going to get better lifting less. Yeah. That's what's crazy. Yeah. You lifting one day or two day a week, like a maps anabolic routine, and you're going to mm-hmm. see a, a better physique. It's just it, that's what's happening right now. Is you're you're probably burnt trying to train that, yeah. trying to train that much, tr- uh, you know, working that much, especially the type of job that you have has that much high demand and late nights like that. So you're probably your sleep is even getting hammered a little bit sometimes. Yeah. So yeah, you I would I wouldn't let you train more than one to two days a week in a, a full body routine like Maps Anabolic, and we would do and the way I would decide one or two is a hundred percent based off of how you feel that week. If we had a okay. good week of rest and it wasn't very stressful or maybe you're not, cause I don't do your only home games, right? Or do you travel too? just home games? So, yeah. Yeah. So like maybe it's the week where they're the, the team's on the road. And so maybe it's, mm-hmm. I don't know if that's a less stressful week for you or not, but on the less stressful weeks, maybe I let you train two full body a uh, week or two full body workouts. If it's a, a week when it's high stress, I might only let you do one. But I, I just doing that with everything that you're doing, I bet you'll see your your body shape up even better with less work. Yeah, that's I, I'm a hundred percent, and I'll take it even a step further. I would go one day a week and then start there and see how you feel before. Because here, here's what I'm going to guess that you're going to do, Sierra. Just <laughs> off of the little bit that we've talked, Adam said one to two days a week. You're probably going to go to two. So I would go yeah. one. I would go one day a week, full body compound lifts, focus on building strength. Okay. And that's it. And give it like two months and you should see your strength uh, significantly improve. And then what will follow that is a improvement in body composition, how you feel energy wise, and then maybe add another day. But I think one day, I mean, 12 hours of dance plus the games, one day a week of good traditional resistance training is plenty. Plus it's the same conversation we had to have with Sal when he was doing competitive salsa. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's it's very similar. Sorry, yeah, thanks. This, yeah, that it, joke went yeah. nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> thanks a lot, Doug. <laughs> you killed my joke. <laughs> no, and I, something you didn't say, but I'm reading in your uh, in the email that you sent in 
is that you also seem to have a pretty good muscle base already. So even more, yeah. even more reason why you won't need as much volume to probably maintain your muscle mass. Yeah. And the reason why maybe your body is not responding very much right now is because you just got so much through getting thrown at it. And yeah. by you backing off, you'll probably actually end up holding on or building more muscle with like Sal saying one day a week or tops two, di yeah. two times a week. Sierra, if you don't have MAPS anabolic, we'll send that to you. And then I'll, I'll say this, if you'd like an individualized routine designed specifically by one of the hosts here at Mind Pump, all you got to do is throw a free ticket to one of the games. <laughs> to, uh, Adam or to Justin. the sports ball event. Yeah, not, not me. I could, I could care less, yeah, yeah. but, uh, you, know, you know, no offense. I can be bribed. But I can be a mascot. You yeah. could get, just throwing that out. I'm going to tell you right now, Adam would definitely design a routine for you if you gave him a couple tickets to All right, just games. let me know what, what games you like. Uh, no problem. But we'll send, right. you, we'll send you MAPS Anabolic, and one of those foundational workouts a week uh, should be plenty awesome. in combination with your, and, and trust the process. Okay. Because yeah. you, you have this kind of like, you know, mentality where you go for things. And, and I understand that mm -hmm. I, I can identify with that. Trust the, give it literally six weeks. Just try for, no, worst case scenario. You, you don't improve. You don't go down. You know, you don't go backwards either. You just kind of stay the same. Yeah. Best case scenario. Okay. You'll, you'll be pretty, uh, shocked at how well your body responds. Awesome. Thank y'all so much. I really appreciate it. No Thanks, problem. Sarah. Sarah. Thank you. Thanks for calling in. Good looking out on getting me some tickets. Yeah, there, right? to, <laughs> to the undisclosed you know what's, team. You know what's right? bullshit though? So I was, uh, for my birthday, I was going to get uh, seats and because uh, it's back, right? So obviously NBA is back to yeah. the arena. But if I sit anywhere where I normally sit on the lower level, like uh, you have to not only be vaccinated, but you also have to wear a mask. They don't count. Uh, they don't count natural immunity, which no, NBA, makes zero sense. NBA is one of the strictest out of all the like companies that are doing like like rules like that. And and of course, we're in the state of California. So if you're NBA, state of California, like yeah. I was going to fly to Texas or Florida to watch yeah. my Warriors play. You're worried you're gonna sneeze on the court or something? Yeah. Well, I mean, look, I get it, but I don't understand why they don't count natural immunity because all the studies show that it, it to be better right. than right. even uh, vaccinated. And immunity. not only yeah. that, so I, if I test, like, so you have to test with, uh, so you have to test, right? So vaccinated, prove that you're vaccinated. Yeah. The test that you have to take of, is their test. Like I can't take like the, you know, the at home one or whatever that. It's like a very specific test that you have uh -huh. to order and do. You have, it has a small window. It's just a head. Anyways, yeah. this, that has nothing to do with our question, but you just made me think. <laughs> I yeah. was like, well, cause that's what sucks is even if she were to hook it up with tickets, I probably wouldn't even fucking could go. Sell them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know what though? Uh, I, I, yeah. I, it's a liability, right? Cause if one player gets sick and they lose, uh, yeah, no, yeah, but I, I, I listen, she was so easy though. I easy, mean, man. This is like yeah. so common with people like her, which I can identify with. It's like, yeah. you're doing all this stuff and you're like, why don't I, why do I feel so tired? Yeah. I'm putting On, the work in, right? Why yes. isn't it uh, paying off? So Especially do less, you know, cause she didn't say it when we were talking, but in her, in her, our notes, it says that she's got like really good muscle mass and she builds muscle really well and has like a solid muscular frame, man, I mean, that type of a body type, uh, and she easily could back off the amount of days she's weight training and probably well, see- You know what the more. irony is? High level people, because this is high level. If you're a professional dancer for a team, I mean, you, you got to yeah, be pretty good. Performing all the time. Yeah. And the irony is people at that level often are able to do what they do at that level in spite of the fact that they overtrain the shit out of the body. In other words- her genetics right. allow her to still do what she's doing, even though she's well overtrained. Because and, the average person doing this would be screwed. Well, That's a only, lot. That's well, twelve hours of dance. Not only that, she's competitive. She's not the average person. Right. She's a, she has a gear that most people don't have, aside from her body type and right. her genetics. In addition to that, she also has competed at the high. She's competing yeah. at the highest level if she's a pro, right? So you got to know that. She has that attitude of like, it don't matter. I'll get through this, yep. which is great. But then they're always the people that I have to tell. Yeah. Listen, like, recovery is a huge. Component yeah, we're to doing this. we're doing way too much. We're yeah. doing way too much. Your body and it's so hard. And I know what it's like because and all of us can relate to this because I think we're all competitive type A personalities. Mm -hmm. Is telling that person that hey, doing less is actually going to give you more. Yeah. It just doesn't seem because everything else you've applied that theory to in life doesn't pay out that yeah. way. If I work harder, I get paid more. Or at the very if I least, I work harder at my my craft, I get better yeah. at my craft. But when it comes to building a body and it comes to body fat percentage and building lean tissue, that the same rules do not apply mm -hmm. as everything else, like getting more money or being more successful in life. The more you do, you tend to get more from it. That's not the way it works when it, yeah. well, when it comes train to smarter, not harder, right? But right. I do want to say I'm I'm glad Justin's mic was off when he tried to reveal my. <laughs> 
my uh, you know my. I wonder my if hobby they still that picked knows. it up, but a lot uh, of people. Hey, a lot whatever. of people. I was throwing you under the bus. Yeah, my competitive salsa uh, days, man. They're behind me, but I those tell hips you, don't was, lie. So it was such were, a great joke too. Those so, hips don't uh, lie. Doug screwed you. It's all right. Our next caller is Jonathan from Colorado. Hey, what's up, Jonathan? How can we help you? Uh, not much. Thanks. I appreciate you guys taking my question here. Um, so I just had a question about how do I overcome burnout? Um, a little bit of history with that. I started taking my health pretty seriously when I was 27, 28. Um, I had reached 315 pounds and it was just kind of affecting my relationships, my personal life, you know, as I know you guys can probably, you can probably know that. Um, but I started out with, uh, doing the beach body programs, their, their hit training and got really into that. Lost a bunch of weight, lost about 90 pounds in a little over a year. Um, and after about a year, like I just, I got tired. I felt like I, I had, I either had to increase or I needed a break and took a break from that. And that break turned into, you know, almost six months to a year of not working out. Um, and then started to get down myself again and, and decided to try uh, weight training um, and I was definitely the new guy at the gym that forgot to clip the bar and would drop the weights and, you know, eventually got you know, my bearings there in the gym and fell in love with that. But again, after about a year, um, I started to get fatigued. I stalled out and I, I, I thought to myself either I have to increase myself to increase my time in the gym to about two hours, you know, almost every workout, which I don't have the time for. Um, so I took a break again. Um, and then again, about a year later, decided to try CrossFit. We're going to skip over that because I know how you guys feel about that. Mm, um, again, did CrossFit for about a year, started to get burnt out, took a break and then joined a strength and conditioning gym. And, and kind of the common theme is just that, you know, every year or so I just seem to hit that wall and take a break and then lose a lot of the progress that I've made. And, and so I was just wondering what kind of advice or, you know, guidance you would give for somebody overcoming burnout. There's, there's another common theme going on here. Yeah. You tend to, you, you tend to get attracted to all the wrong programs. For yeah. You, bro. Yeah. You did beach body, <laughs> uh, CrossFit, the strength and conditioning hit, hit program, like also, just all the things opposite of what I'd have you do if you were a client of mine. Yeah. And you know, also okay. Jonathan, um, I, you sound a little down on yourself by the way you're talking about, you know, how you've handled things in the past, the way you gained weight, how you felt, how you lost weight, how you gave up. Yeah. And so I would say the root issue of what's happening here is you're entering into fitness uh, with a negative mindset. And I don't mean negative like I can't do this. I mean negative about yourself, which yeah. is pushing you to choose workouts that beat you up. Mm -hmm. So this is actually, uh, without you realizing it, you're punishing yourself physically through exercise and your answer to stalled progress is to beat yourself up more. So what, what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to enter into fitness with a completely different attitude, which is I'm going to take care of myself through exercise and exercise is a way to improve my quality of life. Okay. So that means it's going to mold and shape based upon the context of your life as it currently is. That means sometimes you'll work out harder. Sometimes you'll work out not as hard. Sometimes you'll work out more and sometimes you'll work out less because you're going into it to improve the current state of of the quality of your life. So if you're going real hard and you hit a wall and you feel burnt out, the answer then would be to work out less or to train in a way that allows your body to feel better, not necessarily feel like you have to throw more intensity at it or give up altogether. Because by the way, this is very similar to when people go into diets with the same mentality, because at some point, Jonathan, you get sick of hating yourself, which is probably why you quit. You probably get to the point where you're like, you know what, forget it. I just want to enjoy my life. I'm not going to do this anymore. And then the cycle repeats. This is a very hard conversation. A lot of times people don't realize there's multiple gears, uh, you know, that you can apply uh, that'll get you to your destination. And uh, just always kind of throwing it in and redlining your way there. Uh, inevitably, uh, you know, you're going to you're going to hit a wall. You're going to get to that point where you just can't take it anymore. But it's true. There's, there's this little sort of uh, version of yourself. You're punishing. You're trying to trying to kind of change yourself and force yourself to get there when uh, listening to your body and and kind of weaving through all these different uh, challenges in front of you is a much better approach. And uh, to come in with a completely different attitude is going to shape everything for you. I, I want to make sure that we tell you though that this is actually extremely common. Yeah, this is this is the this number one reason why is, people stop. Yeah, it's right. And this is like uh, eighty percent of my clients, like when you when they first hire you. So. Yeah. It's really common that, and it, we just had it. We actually just had a live caller right before you, <clears throat> and afterwards we were talking about her. And one of these things that we we tend to do with fitness is we think that 
the more we do, the harder we do, the more results that we get. And that's that's that applies to a lot of things in life. You work harder, you make more money, you study more for a test, you're probably going to do better at it. The thing with losing body fat in building muscle, it doesn't work that way. The more and the harder you go at it does not equal more results. The right amount is what will equal the most amount of results. And finding what that sweet spot is for you is key. And it, what almost everybody does is they make the decision on the program they're going to do or train the way they're going to do based off their current state. Oh, I'm down on myself, like Sal saying, like, oh, I, I don't like the way I feel. I don't like the way I look. I'm going to go in there and get after this. Or it's a New Year's resolution. I'm going to go in and get after this. And then they throw the whole kitchen sink at their body. Now, yeah. temporarily, they see results. So, of course, if I took somebody who was sitting on the couch, eating bad food, not moving, and I put them on a hit hit program or throw them on CrossFit for the next six months, like, and you stay consistent for six months, you'll probably lose weight. The problem is you went from one extreme to the other extreme, and that's not realistic probably for you or any most other people. So the strategy with someone like you, and if you were a client of mine and I got you right now, I'd actually start you really, really low, one to two days a week. Mm. One to two days a week, an hour routine, like a MAPS anabolic, We and we would build on that. I would make you come to me begging for more time in the gym before I would give it to you. I would say, listen, let's make sure this is realistic with the balance of your life. Let's focus more on building muscle right now. Let's not try and burn a ton of calories and lose a lot of body fat. Let's build this metabolism up so it's working for you and focus on building strength. And that's hard to get somebody who is wanting to lose 50, 100 pounds, they want to drop a bunch of body fat to get them to, to reframe how they approach the training to, hey, I want to build muscle and build your metabolism right now and only train yeah. one or two days a week. That seems so counter of what they want to do or think they should do. But in reality, it's the most beneficial direction for someone like you is to train like that. And then over time, we will slowly build up the amount of time that you're spending in the gym. You do it that way and you will never get burnt out. You're always looking to do more and, and you're keeping yourself held back. Yeah, I'll, I'll give you everything. some guidelines, John. Uh, yeah. You got to feel better after your workout than you do before. Uh, so you got to feel good. Yet Your energy should be higher. You should feel like you're contributing to the quality of your life. When that stops happening, something's wrong. Okay. So think of it that way. That's the way. Now, I, I also noticed that you said that you went on TRT recently. Uh, uh, yeah. <clears throat> how, how has that experience been? So you went through uh, mphormones.com. I'm assuming you went through Dr. Rand's team. Um, so I'm actually in, in Denver, Colorado. So I, I look for a, a local uh, TRT clinic out here. Um, but so I found one in, in Denver Tech Center. So it's Revive MD. Um, but yeah, when I, when I first uh, started, so yeah, when I was looking for a, a health and fitness podcast to listen to, I did a bunch of research and looked at a bunch of review websites and you guys were at the top of almost every single list. And I really thank God for leading me to you guys. Cause I think the first episode I listened to was the, the one with Dr. Ann and oh, wow. just kind of hit home on, on a lot of what I was, you know, no focus, no real motivation to do anything. Just kind of, I mean, I, I remember I would sleep on the weekends, I'd get, you know, 16 hours in bed, wow. you know, Saturday and Sunday and still feel completely exhausted. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. after I listened to that website or that podcast, I, uh, I reached out to somebody that I respect out here. He's a lot like you guys knows the science behind why, not just why or, or what to do. Cool. Um, but Bo Dorning, I reached out to him at V23 Athletics and he referred me to Revive. I went and got tested um, and my my testosterone came back at 214, I wow. think it was. Yeah. Um, and yeah, they, they highly recommended that I get on it. So I finished one month with them. Um, and the next time I got tested, I was up at around 800. Nice. Um, and I, I'm in the middle of my, my third month. So, so definitely starting to feel a lot better, starting to get that, that motivation and drive back, which is good. really why I submitted this question is because I want to get back into it the right way. Good. Now here's a warning. Okay. You're, you're now your testosterone levels are set, uh, in the normal high, you're going to feel a lot more energy. This is not an excuse to beat yourself up That's right. and overtrain. You could still very easily. I know, look, I know guys on bodybuilder levels of anabolics, not TRT, but you know, thousands of times higher than that who overtrain and talk about all the same symptoms that you were talking about. So you're not uh, overtrain proof now because your testosterone levels are, are optimized. Okay. So all the advice we're giving is exactly the same advice, mm -hmm. uh, even though now you're on, uh, you know, testosterone uh, for, for TRT. So you got to do this in a way to where you're taking care of yourself. If you go into it the wrong attitude, you will quit again. You will go into the same cycle again. I promise you. Oh, in one more, let's let's send him over maps and a ball. Jonathan, do you have maps and a ball yet or no? 
Um, yeah, I, I got the uh, the starter pack. So I have the um, intuitive uh, nutrition, the anabolic, and I think the prime. Oh, oh beautiful, seven. beautiful. Yeah. And literally follow anabolic to a T. That's it. Do not try and go ab- above and beyond or add more because you think you can do more. That's not the strategy right now. In fact, I want to do one more thing too. Could you throw Jonathan in our forum too? So I'm gonna, yeah, I got it. Okay, I'm going to throw you in our, our our private forum so you can stay with us and give us updates how you're going because I, I really want to make sure that you follow anabolic to a T and focus actually on building muscle right now, especially since you're on TRT. Your body's going to respond nice to building muscle. This is a great time to speed that metabolism up. But if you follow that uh, that whole program for three months, I guarantee halfway through it, you're feeling like a whole different person. Awesome. I appreciate that. And I mean, yeah, you guys are hitting the nail on the head because I was, I was known at the guy at, you know, at, I went to Lifetime was when I was doing a lot of lift, weightlifting and I would have people come up to me like, man, you really like to kick your own ass. So yeah, you guys, yeah. You guys nailed it on the head. You deserve so to be taking, yeah. you, you, you deserve I to take it, care man. of yourself, brother. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. All right. So, Thanks appreciate for calling, it. Thank man. you so much. No problem. Yeah, it's good. I, I wanted to bring up the you know, the, the fact that he was on, cause in, in his, a lot of listeners don't know, but we get their questions ahead of time. And so I saw that he had said he was on testosterone replacement therapy. And one of the hurdles that, you know, cause we work now with uh, a great TRT facility, by the way, which is, you can do this, I think countrywide, I think they can ship anywhere, um, which you can go to mphormones.com and they're the best ones. We've, uh, you know, we've gone through a lot of them. They're the best ones. But one of the hurdles that people run into is they're like, oh, now I feel great. Testosterone is optimized. Now I'm going to go do that crazy routine and my body's going to respond great. No, it's not. You're not a superhero. You don't have right. like this unlimited recovery ability. You still will run into the same problems. You still, all the same principles apply. And I wanted to say that because if someone's listening who did, who went down that path and they may think, well, you know, working out like crazy didn't work before, but now it will work. Probably not. You're probably still going to overtrain. Well, or even worse, it does work a little bit. I mean, that's, I would, I'm glad you brought that up because, uh, I mean, this was common in the competitive space. I saw lots of guys dieting terrible, training terrible, but yet had great physiques. So, you know, sometimes you- In spite of, right? Yeah, in spite of your your training and your diet, because you're taking TRT, your body responds a hell of a lot better. You know, if you take somebody like this, like this guy who's got, was at 200, yeah. his, and then he goes up to 800, his body is primed to build muscle way better than it was sure. mm-hmm. in the previous three months. So it might send this false signal. He starts going, if he were to go back to his way of routine, it's like, oh, wow, he starts right. losing body fat. He builds a little bit of muscle because he's now on TRT. Yeah. So he, thinks, he pulls himself right out of balance again. That's right. Yeah, but remember, TRT is not like the competitive world. Yeah, I mean, 800 versus no, which no. Is bringing 7, back 000. to healthy yeah. levels. My, which, yeah, my point, though, of bringing better. up the, the competitors is just that you can you can be taking these this testosterone and still be making bad food and exercise choices for yourself yep. and see some results that's the point of bringing that up not that it's the same or anything like that but he that's the i think that's the danger of TRT for someone who doesn't like if you just think that that's the answer right like you go oh like yeah, i have right. super low levels so now i'm just going to add TRT do everything else the same mm-hmm. no you're it's not ideal and even if you do see some results you got to be careful that the, those new results aren't because oh all i just need to do is fix totally. my TRT i have all these other things that i'm doing wrong but because in spite like you said you still see some results because the TRT was yeah. so helpful but i mean his his pattern was super i mean you, you know beach body <laughs> most of the workouts are yeah Hit and routine, yeah, hit CrossFit, based. yeah, just all these like beat the crap out of yourself. And and by day. the way, I mean another. I know we've this is kind of a dead horse for a lot of people that have been listening for a long time. But if you're new to listening and have heard us talk about CrossFit and we we throw jabs every once in a while, this is the reason why because he represents a majority of the people I train in my career, and yeah. I would think you you guys also. Totally. The, oh yeah, he's very very similar to the general pop. And the worst thing this guy can do is go train that way. Well, I had to have these conversations so many times. And I think that's why it sounds like I'm this big hater or something. I'm not a big hater. It's just that I've had to have so many conversations to help people get, you know, restore their body again and like take them back through the the process of finding that right dose because they were so extreme. By the way, I want I do want to say this, uh, working hard doesn't guarantee results in anything, No, in anything, not just your body. Look, you can... Even in business, you can you can work your ass off and apply yourselves in a stupid way. Not be smart, not be efficient. You could do this with anything. I could dig a hole with a spoon, work my ass off. I'm not going to get very far versus using a shovel or a backhoe. So, you know, I know you were saying it works for other things. I think what happens is people progress in spite of the fact 
that they're doing things wrong because they keep pushing the same button, which is harder. But smarter is better than harder always. So, and especially when it comes to your body. Our next caller is Gilda from Pennsylvania. Gilda, what's happening? How can we help you? Hi. Um, so thanks for having me on. I'm really excited to hear your information. Um, I am, um, so I'm 45, 5'9", five, uh, weigh about 150, 18% body fat. I, um, I'm prepping for, well, actually, I'm kind of in the building phase for a bikini competition in probably June of 2022. And um, I've been pretty persistent and consistent with my weight training six days a week, cardio six to seven, like 30 minutes, steady state. Um, I have a trainer and I also hired a nutrition coach from one of those bikini, you know, competition, um, uh, I guess groups, I don't know what you call them, but anyway, Teams. my coach who resistance trains me gave me a set of macros. And then the nutrition coach also gave me a set of macros and they're pretty different. <laughs> and I just don't know which one is the right one for me. Um, and I wanted to know what you guys thoughts are on that. Okay. Well, um, I got, I got a couple questions before we get to the macros. Okay. So sure. the competition you want to do is in, is next summer, correct? Correct. And right now you're in the building phase. That's right. Okay. So you're lift, I have here your written question. It says you're lifting six days a week. You said you're doing fasted cardio also six to seven days a week. Yeah, that's right. Okay. So where do we go from here yeah. when it's time to, to get Why ready so for the show? Yeah. Um, I, I was told to cut back on my cardio, but honestly, it's more for my mental, <laughs> um, then, then walk, well walk instead. yeah, I'm going to suggest yeah. you, you do yeah. something else for your mental because, because, and you can, you can do walk, things that are walk. active that are not what you're, because here's, what's going to happen when you get time to, to cut down for your show, you're going to be left with, you know, three times a day cardio and even more weight training or cutting calories even more. You really want to take advantage of this off season so that the prep is easy and or you don't damage your body after your show because you're already doing a lot with your training. So I would cut back on the cardio or just walk or do yoga or do mobility instead of doing the cardio. Your resistance training six days a week, uh, depending on the routine, that might even be a little too much right now as well. And then I would, looking at the two sets of macros... Uh, it looks like one is higher calorie and one is a little lower calorie. Um, I would go with the higher calorie one to start with well, uh, and, and and stay there and see how you feel. Uh, well, um, well, I'm a, well, I'm not going to disagree, but I, here's the thing. If anyone gives you a macro breakdown just based off of a, a inputting into a computer or you know jumping their calculator out and writing on with a pencil without assessing you, uh, I think they're both bad. Uh, I would not do this with you. So if, what I would do with you, first of all, we'd have to agree that we're going to eliminate the the fasted cardio every morning. You can walk if you really need to and you want to for mental, because I don't want to cut something out that is de-stresses you or helps you, you gather yourself for the day. Like That's totally fine because that's something you'll probably do forever. So I, I you can keep that. But I definitely would back off the intensity and make you walk. Then I would what I'd want to do is mine and your goal for the next two weeks is to see can we find what your calorie maintenance is. So in other words, I'm gonna I'm gonna put you somewhere around maybe these calories because maybe they figured it out on a, off a calculator that says this is where you should kind of be. But really, what I want to do is is figure out what your individual maintenance is based off of your habits and behaviors, not some calculator. We have a calculator, right? We have a Maps Macro calculator where we offer this to people. But I if I'm training a competitor. I've got to be way more precise than this. Like, so I'm going to tell you, okay, we're going to, we're going to track your steps daily. We're going to track how many, how many days a week you're training. And we want it to be as, as, as precise and consistent for two weeks as possible. So we can decide together. Oh, it looks like when you hover right around 2,200 calories, you don't really gain or you don't really lose. Okay. That's your maintenance. Then from there, we're going to build a reverse diet type of protocol where I'm going to add probably 150 calories uh, a day for a couple of weeks to see how your body responds to that. Our goal for the next like two or three months is to build muscle and to build your metabolism, which if that is the goal, we want zero cardio. All the focus is on building strength and slowly adding calories. And so a good place for you and I to get is 
two months to three months out from showtime and you're up to 25 to 2700 calories a day without any sort of cardio, then you're in a beautiful place for me to prep you for this show. And I actually wouldn't even take you on as a client until I could get you up to that point because I don't want to send you into prep already doing six to seven days a week of cardio, only being able to eat 2000 calories because like the like Sal was saying, where do we go from there? Whereas if I could get rid of all your cardio, slowly build your metabolism up, build strength over the next couple of months, get you ready to where you're eating 2,700 calories and no cal no cardio and you're not putting body fat on, we're in a beautiful place to slowly reduce calories and then eventually slowly start to kick up your cardio to get you ready for a show. So yeah. that's kind of what it would look like. And anybody giving you generic numbers, just like me, I wouldn't be able to tell you for sure until together we track for a couple of weeks and have some conversations around, okay, where are you at? How much, how many steps are you taking per day? Okay. And then from there, and by the way, when we start our process to cut, so this is how I did every one of my bikini competitors is we actually didn't add cardio. Cardio was the last thing we did. We actually managed steps first. So let's say on average, uh, my female clients were stepping six to thousand during the bulk phase or where you're at right now, six to 8,000 steps a day. Then when we decided to transition to our cut phase, I would move their step goals up. I'd say, okay, just make sure you get 10,000 steps a day for the next week. Okay. And then the next week would come and I'd say, okay, now just make sure you get 12,000 steps. And I would keep them, I would keep increasing their activity through steps before I say, okay, now get on that because get on the treadmill, start running to get those steps. I would want you to try and get them through just daily movement until you look at me and you go, Adam it's hard for me to get 17,000 steps in a day without getting on the treadmill and kind of getting after it for at least a half hour, hour. And then at that point is when I say, okay, let's start to do that three times a week. Yeah. And you know, looking at the two macro um, pieces of advice that you got, the and this is going to go along with what Adam said. It looks like the biggest differences between your trainer and the nutritionist's advice, besides the fact that they both might've done what Adam said, which is, you know, kind of spit out a generic number is the carbs. Uh, I see your trainer is recommending around 130 grams of carbs and your nutrition coach about 240. And the fats and proteins are a little different in both recommendations, but it looks like the carbs is the biggest difference. That's going to be up to personal preference uh, because some people do very well lower carb and other people do very well higher carb. So I would mess around with that a little bit and see how you feel, right. how your energy is and your performance in the gym. And it's pretty wide, the variance in terms of how people respond to lower carb or higher carb. I, I mean, I've, I've worked with people where higher carb is just, they feel so much better and then vice versa. And yeah. this is the perfect time to be doing that. We're in our building phase right now. We're adding calories. So uh, this goes back again. I wouldn't ever do a generic thing with you for one week. We might run a more higher carb diet. I'm asking you as your coach, how are you feeling? Or do you feel strong? Do you feel sluggish? Are you, re do you feel like how's you're your bloated? Yeah. How's your digestion going? Your stool and you're tell you're giving me that feedback so I know, okay, she does well on 250 grams of carbohydrates. That's great. Or the opposite. You're like, yeah, Adam, I just feel sluggish and bloated all the time. And I don't know what it and then I go, you know what? Maybe we're not, maybe your body doesn't respond as well on a higher carb diet. Let's let's increase fats, let's lower carbs a little bit because calories we want to be consistent with because we're trying to reverse diet. But I may play with the macros, both protein or carbs and fats based off of the feedback that you give me. And just the real goal is to slowly wrap, ramp that calorie intake up until I can get you to a place that's more like 26, 2700 calories, and then start to bring you out ready for the show. Yeah. I hope okay. that helps. Does that help at all? Yeah, absolutely. So gosh, cutting cardio is so hard. For me. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, well, it's always for my bikini competitors. I normally have to, I normally have to shut that down completely. And by the way, so I'm Gilda, I'm going to make sure that Doug uh, get you in the forum. We have actually, we have a lot of, we actually have a lot of competitors that have gone through this process in the forum and everyone's super friendly. If you post in there, let them know what you're doing and your process and the, uh, the advice the guys gave you. And you can even admit the struggle you have with cutting cardio. You'll get a slew of people that have been in the same spot as you that are probably given tips and advice. And like, you'll, it's a great place and community for someone like you. Awesome. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Awesome. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for calling in. All right. Have a good one. You Bye. Too, yeah. How common is that, Adam, in the competitive world where people, they go into prep I, doing everything I, and now they're, yeah. they're left with like, what do I add? It's how me? I ended up uh, building a coaching business when I wasn't really trying to. I was just going to shows and meeting people and I would get these, these 
clients or these, well, they became clients, but I get these competitors that would tell me what their coach had put them on diet and cardio wise. And a lot of these coaches actually have these competitors doing cardio in the off season. But a lot. Yeah. yeah not well, just a lot. Not yeah, just they, some. It's off season. They're already doing it. And then when season started, it's becomes twice a day, three times a day. Yeah. Like it's just ridiculous. And then all they do is just keep cutting calories and calories and have no clue on how important it is for us to build their metabolism up in the off season. So the cutting phase is much easier. Mm -hmm. So it literally, it turned into me just kind of like, telling, explaining that to people. And they'd be like, well, would you coach me? And then I'd be like, well, I'm doing a show anyway. Sure. And then it all of a sudden yeah. became a thing where it turned into a, a side business for me where I was helping these and bikini competitors. It was most common with yeah. it's extremely common that you get a, a client who is doing already cardio and is around this calorie and take 1500 to 2000 and they're doing cardio just to maintain where they're at. And then they want to do a show and like, it's real quick and easy for me to assess that and go, no, like, I know you want to do a show on this date. We're not going to even book a show until we get to a place where we both agree. Mm -hmm. This is a healthy place for your calories to be at with minimal to no cardio that now we're in the place to say, okay, let's pick a show date now that we've got a good metabolism to put ourselves in. It's I such wanna... a hard mindset to break. Oh, it is. Because, you know, and, and you're dealing with somebody like, yes, I will I will go through this building phase, but also I want to shave, you make sure I shave off the fat at the same time. And so that becomes like a thought that like, I need to keep the cardio though, you know, yeah. so that way I don't get, you know, all this extra fat. But I, 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 I didn't, look, I never, I never really coached competitors, but I would get uh, female competitors after they were done competing <laughs> broken yes <laughs> busted yeah. they yeah. come to me and they're working out like crazy and oh i competed three times last year and i'm looking at their their food log i'm like you're eating 1300 calories yeah. and you're working out and six days a week yeah. and you're running doing like three cardio sessions in a row yeah or they or they would they would lose their periods for years or just have all these signs of hpa axis dysfunction so then it was this long process of getting their bodies to heal. And it's because of this. It's like they went into a pre-contest phase redlining, you know, all the way already. So where do you go from there? Now, how do I get my body ready for stage when I'm already doing everything? You just do more. At some point, it back up. Yeah, well, hopefully she goes in that form because there's actually, I know of at least three of ex-clients of mine that is in our private form that I coached for bikini shows. Yeah. So Rochelle's in there for sure. Melissa's in there. And I think Jessica is in there. All three uh, girls that I, I got after either they did it with somebody else or did it on their own and can attest for the way we ramped their metabolism. I tell you, and, uh, Melissa's was the last one I did. And I remember that, I mean, she's what, five, what is most of five, three or shorter, yeah, right? She's, she's a tiny, tiny little petite thing, walks around at 120 pounds, 125 pounds, whatever. She was eating 2,700 calories with no cardio before we decided right. to cut for a show. And when I got a hold of her, she was right around here, 2,000 or so calories, and that was the goal. Let's get you up to a place where you are eating like so much food that you don't want to eat any more food, and then we're ready to reverse out. And I remember we cruised right in with no cardio to the last two weeks. She dieted higher than what she would, what I got her at. So she hit stage at like 20, more calories than she 20, That's right. She hit stage at 2,200 calories when I think I got her around 1,900 or 2,000. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. This is how you got your pro card in men's bikini. <laughs> <laughs> so awesome. Our next caller is Sam from Colorado. Sam, what's happening? How can we help you? Good. How's it going, guys? Good, man. What's up? So uh, my question kind of revolves around uh, transitioning from a cut to more of a strength gaining phase. So I've lost like 30 pounds or so in the last six months, almost unintentionally. I've just been so, uh, my work has been so physically demanding that I've lost all that weight. Um, switching jobs, moving back home to Michigan and excited to get back into the weight room. I'm thinking about starting uh, MAPS Anabolic and MAPS Prime to start and then maybe moving into uh, performance. But my question probably revolves more around nutrition. Like how can I, uh, what's a good strategy to start eating more calories, building metabolism back up and, and building strength and building muscle back without sort of putting on some of that body fat that I've worked so yeah. hard to uh, shed. Yeah. Well, Sam, uh, let's get a little more detail. I see in your question here that you were guiding hunts for yeah. six months. What does that look like? Like, what are you doing with that? And then how, like, how soon can we come out there and you do that for us? Yeah. Next fall, man. All right, let's plan that. Yeah. What so, are we um, kill? so what does that look like guiding hunts? It says for the last six months, what, what, what does a typical hunt look like in terms of, you know, your activity and. Yeah. So it, it depends on clients. 
for me, like September, I'm, I, I like bow hunting. So September's bow hunting archery elk season out here. Um, and it's just so active. Like there, there'd be days where we'd be putting on 15 plus miles hiking with a backpack on. Wow. Uh, and so it's like, you, you can't even eat enough to maintain weight at that rate. And so, you know, there's days where you're guiding older clients and stuff and you're not as active, but in general for the last five or six months, it's just been so much like just putting on miles and, and burning so many calories that, um, that's, I'm, I didn't even weigh myself for like three months. And then I hopped on a scale and I was like, holy shit, I've lost, you know, 20 pounds or whatever. So, um, but I've just, I've lost so much strength and I'm excited to get back into the weight room. But, um, that's why I added that into my question just to kind of explain like, yeah. uh, what kind of what's happening. Yeah, you're, what, a fun, you're a fun client to help. Yeah. You're, be, you're, you're be a fun one to do your body. You're okay. So your body just adapted to what you were doing. So you're hunting, you're hiking lots of miles, probably not eating, probably eating foods you could carry with yourself. So it says in your question, meat, eggs, vegetables. So your body adapted, became quite efficient. You probably got really good at hiking and hunting, but now that you stopped, you want to gain a little bit of muscle mass. And really this is just typical slow reverse dieting. You got the right routine. So you're doing MAPS Anabolic, which is perfect for this. MAPS Prime, which is going to be great because that's going to help you avoid injury and just kind of get into your workout really connected. Um, I would slowly increase calories. Take your current caloric intake and bump it up by about three or 400. Start with that. See how you feel. You should notice a bump in strength. You shouldn't gain too much body fat from that. You should start gaining mostly muscle and then continue from there. Um, I might actually keep him right where he's at calorie wise. Cause he's obviously going to drop the 15 miles a day of, of hiking. You probably are already eating a sufficient amount of calories for building muscle right now. You're just moving. You're not going to, obviously you're not going to be moving 15 miles real soon here. Right. So even though the, the, the calorie intake is, That's a good point. has caused mm -hmm. you to lose a bunch of weight right now for the amount of activity that you're doing, you're about to dramatically shift that. So actually the first couple of weeks, I would actually say, you know what, because I love the I love the mostly meat, eggs, and veggies as far as a great whole food type of a diet. I'd say, well, let's eat very similar to that and kind of what you were doing. Let's see how your body responds to MAPS anabolic. And then after about a week or two, you and I would assess and go like, okay, what are, are we building? Are we still losing? Are you maintaining? If you're maintaining or losing, I'm obviously going to bump calories. But you may actually start to kind of put on some put on some weight and put on good weight because now you're lifting weights because you're just not moving that many miles anymore. So I might actually kind of keep you similar to what you're doing nutritionally right now because the, about your balance is nice. Just and your calorie intake may be actually okay for a guy who's go went from 10, 15 miles a day to now none of that and just strength training. Now, now just just another ultra just to, just to think about your your when you stop all that hiking, you start lifting weights. You're in you're gonna the first few weeks are gonna be very anabolic. Now I'm not just talking about maps anabolic. I mean the state of building muscle, not too different than what you'll find with competitors post show where their body just absorbs nutrients and builds muscle. So after that week or two, uh, you're adding calories. It'll probably all go to muscle. Uh, I think you're probably going to see some really big strength and muscle gains because of the changes that you're doing with your activity. Remember all that activity. Yes, it burns calories over time. Your body adapts to that and your body actually starts to become efficient with calories. But really what's happening is your body pairs muscle down just to make you better at hiking long distances, stalking prey. So it's not necessarily that you're burning tons of calories after a certain period of time. Really, it just becomes your body's just trying to get efficient. So you, you may find that you're just the next couple months is just muscle building time and just you get strong and you feel good and you can fuel that with extra calories on top of the reduction in cal in, in activity. Yeah, listen to your body. I mean, I, the main thing I'd have you focus on is making sure you hit your protein intake every day. Like that would be the main, the main thing that we would be tracking at first would be like, okay, based off your, I don't, I don't think we even covered your weight, right? How much do you weigh, Sam? Uh, I'm like 185 now. Okay, okay, so I'd say, okay, the goal, Sam, is make sure we hit 180 grams of protein every day. That's the main focus. And then I would tell you to feed according to how you feel. If you feel hungry, and you're making sure you're hitting your protein tank, I'd say, oh, I have a few more calories. And then I kind of see where that is at based off of how you feel. And so long as you're making choices like these whole food choices, I'm not really concerned. I don't think you're going to put on body fat 
uh, if you're eating, you know, potatoes and steak and eggs and mm. uh, egg choices like that, I think you're going to be just fine. And, and listen, your body. I'm also I'm also going to have Doug throw you in the forum, so you can kind of give us feedback as you're going through. So you know, you can tell us, hey, this is where I decided to start my calories, and then give us feedback on what you're noticing, and then we can kind of help you tweak it uh, along the way. I like that you're incorporating Prime too, especially because this is going to be a, a massive transition, you know, in terms of like what type of activity you're doing to then, you know, going into more stationary, uh, you know, th this type of resistance training is going to be to put a totally different stress uh, around the joints as well. And then coming back, you know, eventually to doing these guides again, uh, you know, to maintain the the joint function, health and all that, you're going to now build upon, you know, the strength of that, but then the function of it will remain. Yeah. Sam, yeah. what, what are you guys hunting? Just out of curiosity. Mostly elk. Uh, we do some mule deer hunts, uh, antelope hunts, but mostly elk. So when you, when you hit, when you get one, do you guys all, do you also take the Pete, your clients and they have to clean you know, carve the animal, whatever, chop it, and then bring it yeah, back we as well. Do, we do all that. Um, so like the guides will do all the field dressing and then we butcher it and process it ourselves. So do they have to help you carry it back? Uh, no, most of the time it's on a ranch. A few, we own a few different ranches. Uh, it's all fair chase and stuff, but a lot of times we're able to get like a side by side to it. Um, I had to pack my elk out this September, but it wasn't a terrible pack out. So, wow. So you do the, you, you, you carve it up, butcher it, and then you carry it back. They just got to come along. Do you, got, do you guys have a place to this stay on like fun. a play, yeah, a place to stay on the property too? Yeah. We have a pretty awesome lodge. It's all inclusive. We got a chef and stuff. It's Bro, a, it's are you kidding me? This is rad. Can we, can we book this for, do it? I mean, do we have to book it a year in advance? Is we'll, that keep, the, we'll keep your contact yeah. info, Sam. This yeah, sounds like a lot. Yeah. Better. Reach, we'll, reach we'll back out. Um, um, it's usually things book up, not quite a full year in advance. So like we have some clients booked next year, but we usually like to, uh, we at least book out like six months or more in advance, but we like to switch it up a little bit and not get the same people every year. So just bump um, somebody for us. We're celebrities. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Good. No, I'm saying we're not fully booked yet. I'm sure just mm. because every year, like uh, <laughs> all the clients that are here say, can we book up, you know, right after they kill yeah. their elk. Like, this is awesome. Can we book, you know, for next year? Justin's going to want to, he's going to want to take down an elk with a football yeah, helmet. Dude. I know. I definitely, I'm going to stab it. In the I've head. been <laughs> wanting to no. do this, but I've been wanting to do it with a guide and somebody knows what they're doing and you'd be like the perfect person to take. Sounds like uh, all of us on an adventure like this. So this it's, is great. Uh, it's like the, I mean, not just saying this cause I work there, but it, it's like the place to go for your first elk hunt or your first hunt. You just, you learn so much and all of our guides are, I mean, we probably have a hundred combined years of experience guiding. Awesome. Between well, well that sounds great, man. And I, and, and I, I'm looking forward to hearing about your progress uh, in the forum, but yeah, you're, your body is yeah. primed to build muscle. Focus on getting strong and feeding that process. Yeah, you're gonna you're gonna pack on some muscle if you do this right. So that's uh, I guess my last you kind of touched on it, but that'd be where you'd start would be prime and anabolic. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. You're, ne you're next the money. would be next would be maps performance. So right after maps anabolic, go to maps performance. But I would definitely start with anabolic. Awesome. All right, Sam. Thanks for calling in. All right, thanks, guys. No problem. Yeah, so this is a great example of your body adapting to do better at what you're asking it to do, right? So if you're hunting, you're hiking long distances, you're carrying weight on your body, you're doing lots of kind of this low level, you know, kind of steady state type of activity, maybe with some interrupted with certain bursts of, uh, of activity. But what the body does is it pairs muscle down, makes you very efficient. You also get lean, but it also it makes you very efficient with calories. When you're done doing all that, what you're going to ask your body to do is to become less efficient with calories, speed up the metabolism, get stronger, and you will. You'll build muscle doing it. But great example of what happens to the body uh, you know, when you're asking it to do particular things. His body did exactly what it's yeah. supposed to. It just got better at hunting. That's why the math doesn't always equate. You know? yes. and so the, this is a, a good example of that, of like how the body just likes to get a, as efficient as possible at what you present it. Yeah, and I really, I mean, the reason why I came back with the, I wouldn't move the calories up right now is I, I just, when you're doing something so dramatically different as far as activity, um, I like to just kind of eat what feels right and, you know, or when you are hungry, make good choices. Let's assess where that kind of is. Let's assess how your body's moving to decide how much I want to move you up or down in calories. And obviously we're, we're eventually going to bump calories, but sometimes when somebody, it's just like competing. Sometimes when you take somebody who was doing so much cardio, so much weight training in a caloric deficit, just them going back to eating normal 
uh, with the reduction of all that activity starts to pile muscle on and speed the metabolism up. So yeah, it, I think a week or two is fair. Yeah, that's you just you just need to get a, a week or two of assessing uh, how his body is responding right. to where he's currently at, and then the goal will be to start to slowly increase the calories. That's awesome. Look, if you like our information, head over to mindpumpfree.com and check out all of our free guides. So we wrote guides that can help you do everything from build muscle to burn body fat to improving your health and longevity. Again, it's mindpumpfree.com. You can also find all of us on Instagram. So Justin can be found at mindpumpjustin. You can find me at mindpumpsal and Adam at mindpumpadam. 